Today, a health subcommittee was in New York City to look at possible health problems caused by the September 11 terrorist attacks. That hearing's next. Later, results of a study comparing prescription drug costs in the U.S. to those in other countries. I'd like to um, welcome our witnesses and our guests to this congressional hearing uh, and to um, say that this is an important day and we're looking forward to the testimony from our witnesses. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations hearing entitled Assessing September 11th Health Effects, What Should Be Done, is called to order. Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney invited the National Security Subcommittee to New York City today because she understands the threat posed to the health and welfare of all Americans by terrorism and its lingering aftermath. She has been a thoughtful, hardworking partner in our bipartisan oversight of terrorism issues, and we are grateful for the opportunity to be here. In place of the fallen towers of the World Trade Center, these two hard realities cast long shadows over our discussion today. Many first responders are the second wave of victims in a terrorist incident. And public health and disability compensation systems are not fully prepared to acknowledge the unique wounds inflicted by this all too modern war. Firefighters, police, emergency medical personnel, transit workers, construction crews, and other first responders came to Ground Zero knowing there would be risks, but confident their equipment, training, and community would sustain them. But, as we will hear today, better equipment and training standards are needed to match the first responder mission to the new threats posed by catastrophic terrorism and the dissonant patchwork of federal, state, and local health support is in many cases not providing the care and comfort they rightfully expect. After the 1991 war in the Persian Gulf, veteran, veterans suffered a variety of unfamiliar syndromes, faced daunting official resistance to evidence linking multiple low-level toxic, toxic exposures to subsequent chronic health, ill health. In part, due to the work by this subcommittee, long-term health registries were improved, an aggressive research agenda pursued, and sick veterans now have the benefit, in law, of a rebuttable presumption that wartime exposures cause certain illnesses. When the front line is not Baghdad, but Broadway, occupational medicine and public health practitioners may have much to learn from that distant Middle East battlefield. Proper diagnosis, effective treatment, and fair compensation for the delayed casualties of a toxic attack require vigilance, patience, and a willingness to admit what we don't know and might never know about toxic synergies and syndromes. Health surveillance has to be focused and sustained. New treatment approaches have to be tried now in time to restore damaged lives. In this effort to heal the wounds of September 11, 2001 and strengthen public health capacity against future attacks, the federal government has a central role to play. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and its National Institute of Occupational Health are charged to develop and implement health protocols against new workplace dangers like anthrax and novel particulates from the fiery destruction of a building. On our second panel of witnesses today, we will hear about the work of CDC and other federal public health agencies in treating the walking wounded of September 11th. But before appropriately, we will hear from first responders and local officials on the near and long-term health effects of the World Trade Center attack. We appreciate our federal witnesses foregoing the usual protocol of going first so that they could listen and respond to all the testimony today. All our witnesses bring impressive expertise and unquestionable dedication 
to our discussion, and we are grateful they could join us. We look forward to a constructive dialogue on how to mend the wounds of this and other terrorist attacks. This time, the chair would recognize uh, the very uh, gentle, as they say, in terms, oh. and very knowledgeable Miss Maloney. I, I uh, first of all, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Shays, uh, want to thank you very, very much uh, for coming uh, to my district to hold this hearing. Uh, but I also would like to focus and comment on your long-term commitment to issues of public health, including your outstanding and aggressive oversight of the response of the federal government to the Gulf War syndrome. In fact, uh, many people say that the 9-11 health concerns are similar to the Gulf War syndrome and that Washington is, is not uh, really uh, reacting to what is a major health crisis in an appropriate way. The primary question before us today is, is everything being done that could be done uh, to help those uh, workers and victims at 9-11? And that is why I, I asked uh, uh, Chairman Shays to have this hearing. And I regretfully e expect that we will hear today that the answer is no. I have read in some testimony that uh, over 1,800 of the firefighters have had to take early retirement because of health concerns. I have uh, read the testimony of transit workers who called uh, the air at ground zero toxic soup uh, filled with asbestos and pulverized uh, glass and concrete and that fully half their workers are sick. And fully one-third, I am told by uh, Dr. Levine and others at Mount Sinai, are, are still experiencing long-term related health problems. And uh, regrettably, Dr. Levine has told me that 40% of the people they have screened so far do not have health coverage. There is substantial evidence of high levels of upper airway and lung problems, respiratory, digestive conditions, psychological trauma problems, and there are certainly more injured that are waiting in line to be documented. But there still seems to be no coordinated response from Washington. Anyone looking at thousands sickened by one event would think that it would be treated as a health emergency of the highest order. But it doesn't seem that there's been any sense of urgency from the federal government. I hope that this hearing will help sort all of this out. And I know that many of the panelists and my colleagues, I thank them for being here, have a lot of questions. First, what is being done to actually assist the injured medically? That's what I would like to hear from the panel. Is there a coordinated assistance for those that need help? Volunteers, construction workers, residents, first responders who have been injured and have not been able to work since their time at Ground Zero, many of whom have lost their health insurance because they are no longer able to work. Do those who were insured know that many can apply? happening uh, with processing of workers' compensation claims. I hear reports that that is mired in difficulty. And most importantly, are those injured receiving the proper care? Why has there been such reluctance on the part of the government to provide sufficient funds for monitoring? And why have the funds been so slow and getting dispersed? It took over a year to get the leadership in Congress to support the 90 million for the medical screening of World Trade Center workers. Federal resources for the monitoring program, even eight months after they were appropriated, have still not been dispersed and apparently will not be dispersed until May of 2004 at the earliest. Why is this happening? This is wrong. We should figure out how to move the system forward and uh, I hope that NIOSH will explain 
why they are proposing to change the system, and at the very least, uh, their changes should not in any way disturb the monitoring program that is already in place and not have gaps in that monitoring program. And are there sufficient funds in place to properly provide the long-term monitoring that is needed? We've never had a situation in history where pulver pulverized uh, toxic air has been exposed to people, and we need a long-term commitment to monitor these health uh, risks so that we can possibly plan in the future for better preventive uh, 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 equipment to, to protect people at disaster areas. And why are the representatives of the workers so directly impacted by health concerns so unhappy with the work of the city on the health registry? And why are there still privacy concerns about the health registry survey? Why did the registry not work out a pro protocol for providing information and referral for those injured who seek help? I had my staff call the registry and they didn't refer them to any other screening or to any health uh, treatment. And why, after two years of planning, can't the city of New York, the great city of New York, do a better job with this health registry? In light of the uh, relevations about the EPA's public announcements on the safety of the air after the disaster, the immense difficulty the New York uh, City uh, House members in a bipartisan way, along with our senators, had in convincing Washington to support funding, we have to ask why isn't Washington focusing on these issues? And I would like uh, permission to place in the record an article that was in the Daily News today that talks about memos from top scientists uh, that were released to the city about the health crisis in the air and the lack of information and support that got out to the workers. They were not informed. I request permission to put this article Without in. Without objection, so ordered. I, I am in the process of developing legislation, which I hope will be a bipartisan effort, which will focus on many of the issues that we're talking about today. Uh, first, the legislation would make sure that everyone who was injured from their time at ground zero, the volunteers, the bucket brigade, the firefighters, fire officers, iron workers, construction workers, all of those that do not have health coverage, that they get health coverage that covers their health concerns because they risk their lives to save other people. And I ask, a final question. How in the world are other first responders going to respond to disasters if they see that the first responders who rushed to 9-11 are not at the very minimum given health care and health screening and health monitoring for their health concerns because of their selfless act to rush and save the lives and work to reconstruct our city. And I. Um, would like to place in the record the draft of the legislation. Uh, it also calls uh, for the monitoring to continue for 20 years and uh, for research to look into what this means, this new type of toxic air that, has, that Americans or no one on earth has ever experienced before on their long-term health needs. And it tries to facilitate a better coordination and oversight. And uh, I just, coming here today, I saw a bumper stick sticker that said, Remember 9-11. You see them everywhere. Remember 9-11. But I hope that today, uh, with this focus, that Washington will also remember, the city will remember, and we will get the proper care to the workers. And I hope that this is the beginning of a new and urgently needed focus on the health impacts of 9-11. And I uh, strongly commend the work of the chairman on the Gulf War Syndrome and for his attention and for being here today. Thank you. I thank, I thank the gentlelady, and at this time, the chair would recognize the vice chairman of the committee, Mr. Turner, and thank him uh, for being here, uh, given he has uh, constituent issues in, in his home state of Ohio, and I thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, our chairman, Chris Shays, and Mrs. Maloney for having this hearing and for focusing on these important issues. Mrs. Maloney, thank you for having us in your district. 
Uh, our Chairman Crochets has been a leader in the issues of looking at terrorism and our preparedness both on the le local and federal level uh, and our responsiveness to the issue of how do we prevent terrorist attacks, how do we prepare for them, and how do, how do we respond. Even prior to September 11th, um, our Chairman had made certain that this committee looked at ways that information could be uh, disseminated to communities and throughout the federal government in assisting us in our preparedness uh, for terrorist attacks. I am the only representative who is here who is not from the larger New York metropolitan area. Uh, but I can assure you uh, that this is a national issue. It's a national issue not only because September 11th was a national tragedy, um, but because the preparedness, the re information that we learn from this experience is important to all of us in our country as we look to lessons learned and how we can prepare in the future. Uh, also, for my community, uh, Dayton, Ohio, I served as mayor for Dayton uh, during September 11th, uh, 2001, and even our community sent EMS fire um, and EMS responders here as part of the recovery operation in response to New York's broader request that states throughout the region send responders here. So I, I met our responders as they were returning from New York and spoke with them about what they saw and how um, their efforts here uh, impacted their lives. And I'm very interested then in, in uh, how the overall environmental impacts uh, might have affected the efforts of really what was the response from many states in helping New York. We do have a lot of real important work here to do today. Uh, one is the evaluation of current spending. Now, there have been millions of dollars that have been spent and millions of dollars that have been allocated. Have they been allocated to the appropriate things? And what are the needs that we need to address? And looking at the needs, we're obviously going to be looking at the issue of the full impacts, not just those that are immediately obvious, but as we further study this and look to the impacts in, in this community. And then also the third would be on the issue of just lessons learned not only for processes, but substantive, technical, scientific information that we have learned. Uh, I'm very uh, excited about participating in this and uh, learning uh, from all the experts that you've uh, assembled uh, the information that we need as we look to proceed in the future. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. At this time, uh, the chair would recognize Mr. Towns, not a member of the subcommittee, but a member of the full committee. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by thanking you and all my colleagues for holding this very important hearing. I appreciate that you're holding the hearing in the city that the most damage occurred, and that is a fact. The tragedy of 911 was felt more by our city than any other place. We encountered the greatest fiscal destruction, and we lost the most lives, and thousands of families still mourn. The magnitude of this devastation which was easily seen by the entire world. I have been and remain concerned about the lack of attention paid to those who live right outside of Manhattan. As someone who represents parts of Brooklyn, I am most concerned about my Brooklyn constituents. The research shows that my concerns should not be ignored. According to the Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences Institute of Univer uh, uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey, the intense heat of ground zero blew debris, gases, and particles upwards, creating a loft effect, which may have caused these pollutants to drop on people living in Brooklyn. New York Newsday reported this finding in an article on September 11th of this year. However, this evidence is not new. On August the 23rd, 2002, Newsday reported that high-resolution photographs shot on 911 by satellites show clear images of toxic debris getting blown into a southeasterly direction from ground zero across the Brooklyn Bridge into several neighborhoods. I'd like to submit this article, Mr. Chairman, for, uh, uh, for the record of Newsday of September the 11th. This was also confirmed by an October 2002 American Prospect article that said, it is now clear, thanks to NASA, uh, NASA photographs, that the black toxin the wor of World Trade Center debris blew for more than 30 hours directly from Ground Zero to the East River, which separates Manhattan from Brooklyn and Queens. Let me point out, three Brooklyn hospitals reported increases in visits related to respiratory ailments. While I share several concerns with my colleagues about 
the health consequences stemming from the WTC disaster. I especially look forward to hearing from the witnesses on this issue. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. And again, I thank you for holding this hearing in the greatest city in the world. Thank you. I yield back. I think most people agree it is the greatest city <laughs> in the world. It is. And uh, those of us who live uh, near it uh, recognize that uh, we have uh, what, what happens to New York directly impacts us, and we care deeply about this greatest city in the world. Uh, Mr. Nadler, we're delighted to have you join us. Uh, Mr. Nadler is not a member of the Government Reform Committee. He is a very active member, particularly of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and he is, I think, uh, uh, the representative who represents the district uh, we're talking about directly, Ground Zero. And uh, at this time, Mr. Natalie, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin by thanking you for holding this hearing today regarding the health effects of the September 11th terrorist attack on those who live or work near Ground Zero, and particularly uh, for allowing me to participate in this committee uh, though I'm not a member of the committee. As the member of Congress representing Ground Zero, I have heard from far too many constituents in the last two years who have health problems because of contaminants in World Trade Center dust that the EPA refuses to clean up or to acknowledge, despite the fact that OSHA considers the dust to be regulated as best as containing material, and expert scientists have measured air pollution levels worse than the Kuwaiti oil fires. Two years ago, in the days following 9-11, the EPA said the air in Manhattan was safe to breathe, despite the fact that they had no scientific evidence to make such a claim when they made it, and they continued to make it, even when they had ample scientific evidence that it was not true. After hearing from many constituents who told me they were getting sick and that the EPA refused to help them with decontaminating their apartments, in January 2002, I asked the EPA's ombudsman to investigate EPA's inaction. After the EPA's ombudsman's office uh, conducted two field hearings, which elicited considerable information, the EPA showed its displeasure by dismantling the ombudsman's office. In April 2002, I published a white paper on EPA's malfeasance, and in June testified of that year before the Senate on the inadequacy of the EPA's indoor cleanup plan, which they announced a mere eight months after 9-11 in May of 2002. Two months ago, the EPA's Inspector General issued a release, or rather released a report documenting what many thousands of New Yorkers already knew, that the EPA had given false assurances to the people of New York regarding the air we were breathing, and that the EPA had re refused and to this day refuses to take responsibility to decontaminate indoor spaces such as apartments, offices, and schools, despite the fact that they are legally mandated to do so. We know that several hazardous substances were present in the World Trade Center dust and were released into the environment when the towers collapsed. Clearly, that presented a hazard for rescue workers on the pile. And one of the purposes of today's hearing is to investigate the government response to the sickness and problems caused by those hazards, and what I would say is the clearly inadequate government response. But those hazardous substances were also present in World Trade Center dust that was blasted, often with great force, into surrounding buildings and settled in homes, schools, and workplaces. Although the EPA declared that the outdoor, safe was, that the air, outdoor air was safe and this declaration was premature, enough time has passed that it is probably true that the outdoor air is no longer a problem today. On the other hand, the problem of indoor environments and exposure to hazardous World Trade Center dust that settled inside buildings persists to this day. And we have every reason to believe that thousands of people are being slowly poisoned day by day indoors in workspaces, schools, and homes, as, uh, and will continue to be so until action is taken to thoroughly investigate and clean up these spaces. As OSHA Secretary John Hedshaw wrote on January 31st, 2002, and I see in the packets that were presented here, a copy of his letter was placed, quote, in that the materials containing asbestos were used in the construction of the Twin Towers, the settled dust from their collapse must be presumed to contain asbestos, close quote, 
and therefore OSHA federal regulations apply to the removal of this material. Nonetheless, the government told the public it was safe and advised average citizens to clean up World Trade Center dust with a wet mop and a wet rag. In May of last, which was illegal advice, if you assume that that has asbestos in it, as well as recklessly dangerous advice. In May of last year, the EPA announced a limited indoor cleanup plan. This plan was a complete sham designed to deflect criticism of the agency, not to address, actually address the problem. And they practically admitted that by saying, there is no problem. This is being done to allay public fears. Translation for PR. As confirmed in the EPA IG report, the agency's indoor cleanup program was wholly inadequate and did not meet even the minimum criteria for protecting human health established by law. And the EPA refused, despite repeated requests, to require that its contractors in the cleanup program uh, require that their workers wear protective equipment. So we can expect that many of the workers in the cleanup program a few months from now will come down with respiratory ailments. The federal government has never followed its, its legally mandated procedures to track the release of hazardous materials, characterize the site, and clean up buildings contaminated in the terrorist attack. It has not done, and in this morning's Juan Gonzalez uh, article, he quotes this uh, uh, expert at uh, ATSDR at saying that one of the first things they must do is characterize the site, which they have never done. Um, it has not done the proper test, comprehensive testing to determine who has been exposed, what they're exposed to, and the full extent of how, how far this contamination has spread. This is why Senator Clinton placed a hold on Governor Levitt's nomination as EPA Administrator, and she should be applauded for getting this issue back on the national radar screen. But until the EPA agrees to fully do its job, the issue will not go away. This is a very real, serious, and continuing health issue that must be addressed. I have heard from many constituents who have found World Trade Center debris in their homes or workspaces and who are now sick. The title of this hearing is Assessing September 11th Health Effects, What Should Be Done? It is very obvious what should be done. All the workers on the pile should have physical examinations, and their health care needs as a result of this catastrophe for the balance of their lives should be paid for by the federal government. The federal government should carry out its mandated responsibility to clean up buildings contaminated in a terrorist attack. The EPA should adopt and implement the recommendations in the IG report, and the federal government should assume the responsibility of ensuring the proper treatment for those sickened by World Trade Center debris, particularly in cases where exposure was a result of government negligence and malfeasance. In conclusion, let me summarize by saying that I regard there as being three victim populations that should be looked at separately besides the people who were killed directly by the terrorist attack. One is those people who were exposed, uh, who got an acute exposure by being caught in a toxic cloud, and we should monitor and help them with their health problems, uh, but no one is, fault, is at fault other than the terrorists. Second are those responders who worked on the pile for 30, 40, 50 days without proper protective equipment, have gotten sick as a result, and after the first few days, it was inexcusable that not everyone was wearing proper protective equipment. And again, we have to examine all these people, we have to take care of their health problems, but somebody should be held responsible for why proper protective measures weren't taken. Thirdly and finally are the thousands of people who are today living and working in contaminated workspaces, contaminated apartments, contaminated schools, which have not been inspected and have not been cleaned up. And we can predict that 15 years from now, many of them will come down with mesothelioma or asbestosis or lung cancer. We can also predict that we can greatly minimize that problem if we do this proper inspection and cleanup now, which is why this is a current issue. It's not simply a question of dealing with past damages. We can we can still eliminate most of the pr health problems from those people if, we, if the EPA follows the Inspector General's recommendations, properly uh, looks at all the neighborhoods, not just below Canal Street, but wherever that dust cloud went, inspects and uh, uh, cleans up. I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and I look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses today. Thank you. I thank the gentleman very much. I'm going to just do a little housekeeping here and ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record uh, and by members, participants.
uh, and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose without objection so ordered. I ask you for the unanimous consent of all witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask even further unanimous consent that Representative Towns, a member of the Government Reform Committee and any other member of the Government Reform Committee who may show up, and Representative Jerry Nadler uh, sit with this committee as a full participant and without objection so ordered. Uh, before recognizing the witnesses, I, I want to say, since this is the first hearing, this hearing will raise many questions. A number will not be answered today, nor will we even seek to, to get some questions answered. Uh, we've heard very important statements from all the participants at this hearing. Ultimately, it would be the goal of this committee to have every one of those questions answered and every problem dealt with. At this hearing, and I want to say I'm going to be pretty uh, focused on this and pretty strict in adhering to it. At this hearing, uh, we are focused on the workers and first responders' health conditions, their diagnosis, their treatment, their compensation. This hearing does not focus on residents. It doesn't focus on other uh, workers who may uh, work there. It doesn't focus yet on the cleanup of uh, facilities there. Uh, and we will. We will focus on those issues, and we will uh, make sure that uh, any member who has uh, um, uh, raised these questions gets answers to those questions. Uh, at this time, uh, I would uh, recognize our, our participants. We have uh, our first panel, Dr. Robin Herbert, co-director of the World Trade Center Worker and Volunteer Medical Screening Program, medical co-director of Mount Sinai, uh, and she is accompanied by Dr. Stephen Levin, uh, co-director of the World uh, Center Worker and Volunteer Medical Screening Program. Uh, so Dr. Herbert will be giving the statement. We then have uh, Commissioner Thomas uh, Frieden, uh, a doctor, New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Dr. Uh, Michael Wyden, medical officer, New York Fire Department, uh, Mr. Philip McArdle, Health and Safety Office, Uniform Firefighters Association. Mr. Jimmy Willis, Vice Chair for Conductors, Assistant to the President, Transportation Workers Union. Mr. John Graham, Health and Safety Instructor, Carpenters Union. And Mr. David Rapp, former worker at the World uh, Trade Center site. Uh, I, we don't usually have this many panelists we uh, have been pretty liberal when we have a smaller panel of being able to go over the five minutes. I would really respectfully ask that you uh, submit your statement of five minutes. And if you think you need to redo it a little bit, I can skip over you to give you a little time. But uh, you know, if you go five and a half minutes, uh, maybe a little longer. But we would like you to stay somewhere within that, that range. And so uh, at that point, I need to do one more thing. I don't know if you can all stand up in this cozy area we have, but I do need you to stand. Uh, I do need to swear you in. <coughs> Raising your right hand, please, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Note for the record, all our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. We are going to start uh, with you, Dr. Herbert, and we're just going to kind of go down the line here. And uh, we'll do a lot of good listening. That's why we're here. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to testify today. The September 11th terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center resulted in horrific loss of life. Amid the shock and grief we all experienced immediately after the attacks, some failed to recognize that the terrorists had also created one of the worst acute urban environmental disasters ever to occur in U.S. history. Soon after the attacks, various New York area health care providers, including ourselves, began seeing workers and others with serious health problems due to their World Trade Center exposures. Many of us participated in a working group assembled by NIOSH to develop common approaches to the diagnosis and treatment of World Trade Center related health effects. In June 2002, Mount Sinai received $11.8 million in federal funding to establish the World Trade Center Worker and Volunteer Medical Screening Program. This funding enabled us to design and coordinate a consortium of health care centers in the New York metropolitan area and nationally to provide free medical screening examinations for World Trade Center responders who were involved in various rescue and recovery efforts. 
In January 2003, we released some preliminary findings from an analysis of 250 of the first 500 people who'd come through the program. We reported that 78 percent had had at least one World Trade Center-related pulmonary symptom while working or volunteering at the site, and 46 were still experiencing at least one pulmonary symptom in the month before the screening exam, up to 10 months after September 11th. 88 percent had had at least one World Trade Center-related ear, nose, or throat symptom while performing World Trade Center response work and 52 percent were still experiencing at least one ear, nose, and throat symptom in the month before the screening exam. Finally, 52 percent reported mental health symptoms requiring further evaluation when they came for screening. We have now seen over 8,000 men and women in our screening program, and we now know that a substantial number of World Trade Center responders have developed upper and lower respiratory problems that are lasting as long as two years. However, we do not know what the long-term effects of the World Trade Center exposures will be, and in particular, we're concerned about cancers. Because of the high prevalence of persistent World Trade Center-related health problems we were, see we were seeing, as well as the worry about what the long-term consequences might be, it became clear that there was a need for both long-term medical monitoring of responders as well as a need for tre medical treatment for those who have developed World Trade Center illnesses. For these reasons, we joined with fellow occupational health experts, labor leaders, and concerned federal legislators in an intensive year-long lobby for federal resources for long-term medical monitoring. Last February, it was announced that this money had been appropriated. Although we still await the final award of that funding, we join with thousands of ill and injured workers and volunteers in our appreciation of your efforts to secure those resources. Of the $90 million allocated in the early winter of 2003, $4 million has been provided to allow us to expand the baseline medical screening program so that 3,000 additional workers and volunteers will receive free comprehensive medical screening exams. Another $25 million is allocated specifically for exams of New York City firefighters, and the remaining funding, approximately $56 million, will be used to establish, coordinate, and conduct a program for long-term medical monitoring of World Trade Center responders. However, these funds are unfortunately insufficient to provide periodic medical examinations of World Trade Center responders for the 20 years that we would advocate. We estimate that the current funding will support a program to conduct screening exams of 12,000 responders every year and a half for five years only. However, we would recommend screening for a minimum of 20 years because the World Trade Center responders sustained exposures without precedent. These exposures may cause new unexpected health consequences, including possibly cancers, which would be unlikely to show up for at least 15 years after the time of exposure. This means that the screening program as currently funded will not last long enough to ensure that diseases that develop only after years have passed can be detected when they're still treatable. Equally pressing at this time is the need for treatment. We are identifying many people who need ongoing treatment for World Trade Center related physical and mental health problems, but unfortunately, there is still not an adequately funded treatment program. At Mount Sinai, we have sought and received funding from private philanthropic sources to establish a treatment program for a limited number of World Trade Center responders, but philanthropy can simply not provide all the resources necessary to provide care who need it. Among the first 350 patients we have seen in our treatment program, we found that 75 percent have persistent World Trade Center related upper respiratory pro problems, 44 percent have persistent World Trade Center related lung problems, and 40 percent have persistent mental health consequences related to the disaster. But 40 percent do not have medical insurance, and about one third are now unemployed. It is thus urgent that funding be made available to provide access to medical and mental health care for all who sustain mental health consequences from the World Trade Center disaster, workers and volunteers involved in rescue and recovery, workers from the immediate area, and area residents, as well as their children. In conclusion, funding is vitally needed to supplement the current appropriation of $90 million in order to extend the duration of the long-term medical monitoring program for a minimum of 20 years, two, to ensure access for treatment to, for all World Trade Center related health problems identified in screening programs, three, to ensure that those who develop future health problems related to World Trade Center exposures are able to receive treatment for those conditions, 
and four, to support clinical research to better understand the human health consequences of the exposures and most importantly, to identify treatment modalities for those conditions. Surely those who responded so selflessly to the, to the disaster deserve no less. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Commissioner. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Dr. Thomas. Friedman. The mic on. Good morning. Can you hear it? I'm Dr. Thomas Frieden, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I want to thank the Chairman Shays, the committee, and especially Congresswoman Maloney for holding these hearings in New York City. The immediate effects of 9-11 included the deaths from terrorist attack of nearly 2,800 New Yorkers, in addition to the passengers and crew of the two planes that crashed into the WTC. Our efforts now are focused on the many people who may experience long-term health problems as a result of 9-11. The WTC Health Registry is a critically important effort to evaluate the short and long-term effects to both physical and mental health that may have resulted from 9-11 a comprehensive, strictly confidential health survey of the most highly exposed people, it will identify which groups and exposures most increase the risk of health problems and which are most in need of medical intervention. Significant findings will be shared as soon as they become available and reports will be posted on the web every three months. We intend to track per the health of persons who enroll for up to 20 years. The registry is unique. It is the only project that will allow comparisons across groups and facilitate long-term follow-up of a large representative group of people with a wide range of exposures and health histories. It's our best chance to find out both the spectrum of health effects from 9-11 and to identify and target services for the medical needs arising from 9-11. Findings will help participants, others exposed, and the general public, and will provide critical information for medical professionals who evaluate and treat exposed persons. It is a systematic evaluation that should allow us to make conclusions about the health effects of 9-11, both for those who participate and for those who do not participate in the registry. It is not an attempt to identify and monitor every exposed person. It's also not a telephone diagnostic program intended primarily to find people with medical problems and provide care. The registry will identify syndromes and conditions associated with exposure and will put clinical studies into perspective. We need both the detailed clinical evaluation that is provided by Mount Sinai, NYU, and others, and the comprehensive approach the registry provides. The registry is a collaboration between the Health Department, ATSDR, FEMA, and New York City community and business organizations. The development of the scientific plan for the registry has, from its inception, involved the collaboration of scientists from many academic institutions, both within and outside of New York City. ATSDR has committed funding for project years two through five for core functions. However, beginning in calendar 2005, we will need at least $2 million more per year for basic registry functions for the intended 20-year life of the project. We're very pleased with the response to the registry in the first eight weeks of enrollment. More than 10,000 people have completed the telephone interview. Another 5,000 have pre-registered, and these numbers continue to increase each day. We are also uh, reaching tens of thousands of others for whom we already have contact information. The registry has a federal certificate of confidentiality ensuring protection of individual information by, from subpoena or Freedom of Informa Information Act requests. The registry is the most recent of many activities conducted by the Health Department following 9-11. These include syndromic surveillance to identify clusters of illness, inspection of food distribution, mandated washing stations, emergency department monitoring for injuries, rescue worker injury and illness monitoring, community needs assessment of Lower Manhattan, indoor air quality assessment, and the department also implemented Project Liberty, a FEMA-funded crisis counseling and public education program. Project Liberty has assisted more than 900,000 New Yorkers affected by 9-11, serving a population ethnically diverse and similar to the city as a whole. Project Liberty is scheduled to end on December 31st of this year. We're hopeful for an extension so that the fire and education department programs can continue. In conclusion, I want to thank you for your interest and support. However, much more needs to be done, both to address the needs of those still suffering from the effects of the attack and to ensure that we're as prepared as we can be. The city continues to ask the administration and Congress to provide bioterrorism and homeland security funding based on risk and consequence. We were the target of two of the four planes hijacked on 
we were the target of four of seven anthrax-laden envelopes sent in the fall of 2001, and we are the target of most of the terrorist chatter that mentions a specific location. But despite having more than half of the nation's recent attacks and having more than half of the risk of future attacks, we receive less than 1 40th the federal dollars for bioterrorism preparedness. In fact, per capita, New York City ranks a shocking 45th out of the 54 jurisdictions receiving bioterrorism funding. We've asked that the administration and Congress for more than $900 million for emergency preparedness, 100 million of which is for the health department. And as I noted before, the WTC Health Registry, our best, best chance to know the health effects of 9-11 and most effectively target long-term interventions has a large funding gap in the out years. Thank you for your interest and continued support. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Dr. Wyden. Uh, dear Chairman and members, today I've been asked to talk about the health and welfare of FDNY firefighters and EMS rescue workers after 9-11. I'll focus on what lessons we've learned and what changes should be made as we move forward. On 9-11, 210 story towers and several other buildings collapsed during rescue and evacuation. With these collapses, FDNY firefighters and EMS rescue workers went from being first responders to victims. Although first responders accounted for nearly 12% of the dead, our surviving firefighters and EMS and rescue workers continued to work uninterrupted both at the WTC site and throughout NYC. We must never forget that despite the tragedy of that day, FDNY successfully evacuated over 20,000 civilians and saved countless lives. The extraordinary heroism of our firefighters and rescue workers will forever remain a beacon of courage, commitment, and dedication. WTC dust is pulverized concrete, fibrous glass, silicates, carbon par particulate matter, and asbestos. The upper airways were overwhelmed by this burden, and the dust had an extraordinarily high pH, causing deep burns of lung, sinuses, and the esophagus. Since inhaling this dust can cause considerable harm, it was important to find out if masks or respirators were available or were actually worn by FDNY rescue workers. By week two, 70% of firefighters had the proper respirator for this exposure, but only 30% were able to wear it most of the time. Why? Because these masks were uncomfortable and difficult to communicate to through others. To improve respiratory protection at future disasters, we need better planning, improved respirator design and supply. Two years after the WTC, we still don't have that. Improved design and supply will naturally lead to improved compliance. FDNY Bureau of Health Services understood the new need to provide immediate medical monitoring and treatment. From October 2001 to February 2002, we provided every FDNY firefighter and EMS worker with the opportunity for a full medical. We also partnered with the CDC and NIOSH to provide specialized tests that were not part of our standard medical. Several months into the World Trade Center rescue and recovery effort, two Port Authority police officers were reported to have high mercury le levels. In response, authorities wanted to close down the site that would have created enormous emotional stress to every family member still waiting for a loved one to be found. At that point, FDNY's Bureau of Health Services had already done urinary mercury levels on over 8,000 people, and none were elevated. These findings allowed the site to remain open, a major untold benefit for families of the missing. We have found that 25% of the highest exposed FDNY firefighters have hype, airway hyperreactivity and many have asthma or reactive airways dysfunction. <laughs> to date, 280 FDNY firefighters have qualified for retirement disability pensions due to permanent lung impairment, and we project that anywhere from 300 to 500 additional firefighters will ultimately be permanently impaired from respiratory disease. Respiratory problems are not the only issues FDNY is coping with. Since 9-11, our firefighters and EMS rescue workers have been functioning under incredibly high stress levels. They have lost coworkers, they have lost friends, they have lost family. They have a different role in life now. They've been, uh, been exposed not just to fires, they've been exposed to a new mission. In our FDNY FTC 
WTC um, medical monitoring program, 48% of our rescue workers reported difficulty sleeping, 36% reported unusual irritability, 34% reported difficulty concentrating, and 33% reported anxiety. These are major problems for people who did not have problems pre-WTC. 80% of our firefighters and EMAS rescue workers, independent of their age or their extent of WTC exposure, indicate that they are concerned about their health, and 20% are worried about that their future may be shut, cut short. Since 9-11, our counseling unit has rapidly expanded to provide educational, group, and individual sessions using funda, funding from Project Liberty, the IAFF and FDNY and local unions and private philanthropies. Project Liberty dollars supplemented by these other sources has allowed us to provide individual counseling center sessions to over 5,700 FDNY rescue workers and families. These individual counseling sessions are in addition to the many group therapy, firehouse briefings, department-wide interventions that we've done since that time. Um, to serve their needs um, and to allow uh, FDNY to continue to serve the needs of New York, it is essential that Project Liberty be continued past its 2004 end date. In conclusion, we cannot prevent the exposures that have already occurred to these men, but through the long-term medical monitoring and counseling programs that I have described today, we can all work to restore the health of those who did survive. That's why the federal funding provided for long-term medical monitoring of WTC rescue workers is critically important. We are glad that the recent agreement has been made that should help with the release of these funds. We need to continue our commitment to each FDNY firefighter and EMS rescue worker, a covenant that states, when you come out of the flames, we will be there for you. Thank you, Dr. White. And I know that you had to skip over parts of your testimony. The whole testimony will be part of the record. I appreciate your assisting us, and I know others of you did that as well. Uh, Mr. McArdle. Good morning, everyone. I am Philip McArdle, Health and Safety Officer of the Uniform Firefighters Association. I would like to thank this committee for inviting me to present this information to you on behalf of the 8,500 firefighters serving the City of New York. It has been over two years since the 9-11 attacks and almost one year since the UFA began lobbying before the U.S. Congress for 9-11 medical monitoring money. Many of the long-term health issues that I will discuss here today have been reported many times to committees, in congressional hearings, and to the Department of Homeland Security. Unfortunately, even after the countless task forces, testimonies, circumstances have not changed for the members of the Uniform Firefighters Association. In fact, in our opinion, the opinion of our executive board and our membership, the situation has gotten worse. In the days following 9-11, many firefighters were not given the proper respiratory protection devices, even though complaints about this issue had been made for years. The department did not have, and still does not have, a respiratory protection program as required by federal regulations for air purifying respirators for well over 10 years. This is clearly a violation of the Code of Federal Regulations, 29 CFR 1910-134, which states the standards for respiratory equipment, supervision, and use. The results of improper respiratory protection are clearly stated in a study conducted by Mount Sinai more than a year ago with support of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health that found 78 percent participating first responders reported to at, uh, at least one WTC-related pulmonary symptom. The same study reported that 52 percent of the 9-11 workers are suffering from some form of post-traumatic stress syndrome. It was within one year of these numbers have increased. Unfortunately, we cannot provide you with any specific data about the amount of increase in the health problems because the funds that were allocated for the long-term medical care of our members have not been distributed to the FDNY Bureau of Health Services. We are still waiting for that money, and it has not come. The holdup in the distribution of funds, coupled with the reality that no money has been allocated for treatment of WTC victims related illnesses, has resulted in the health needs of our membership being neglected because of partisan politics and bureaucratic red tape. 
As of October 2003, the FDNY has retired approximately 1,800 firefighters due to WTC-related illnesses. And I'm just going to break from my testimony for one second to make another point. As late as last night, I was told by the department that there are still some 600 members of our department who are still waiting to be processed out of the organization. Both union and fire department, both the union and the fire department agree that this is un unprecedented retirement rate will continue as more firefighters are examined and diagnosed with 9-11 related illnesses. All 1,800 of these firefighters were healthy before 9-11 and would most likely have worked for the fire department for an average of 20 years or longer, which had been the trend prior to 9-11. Instead, we have members who in some cases are as young as 30 years old who will be disabled for the rest of their lives. As retirement decreases, it will cost more for long-term health care than ever before. Prescription drugs is our biggest concern. The New York City Firefighter WTC Medical Monitoring Treatment Program that will be run by FDNY Bureau of Health Services with joint sponsorship of the UFA, the UFOA, and the EMS and paramedic unions has found that in the first four months, four firefighters required life support mechanical ventilation for chest surgery for severe respiratory stress following WTC exposure during the collapse. Ninety-five percent of the firefighters complained of new onset respiratory symptoms, mostly cough during the first week. In the first six months following the collapse of uh, 343 FDNY firefighters required more than one month of medical leave for new onset respiratory illnesses such as asthma. And nearly two years later, over 1,800 FDN1 firefighters have or are in the process of receiving permanent disability for new onset of post-WTC asthma and respiratory injuries. Random voluntary testing of the highest exposed group of FDN, uh, FDNY firefighters present during the first day of collapse has found that 25 percent have new onset post-WTC airway hyperactivity asthma on objective medical testing, methocal choline challenge testing. This has persisted on serial testings. Firefighters who were not present during the collapse but were there during intense rescue and recovery efforts over the next 48 hours, nearly 7 percent have new onset post-WTC and persistent airway hyperactivity. This is not a New York City issue. This is a national issue because the United States government is handling the situation. It is and will be looked at as a template for what could happen in the future. Long-term health problems, increased disability claims, and the rising cost of prescription drugs need to treat these problems will financially impact everyone, not just the people in New York City. We strongly believe that the $25 million that was appropriated specifically for firefighter EMS long-term health care monitoring needs to be distributed to the FDNY Bureau of Health Services as soon as possible. This program is already in operation and is carefully monitored by an expert advisory panel that includes many notable experts in this and related fields. This program is in danger of ending without funding that has already been appropriated but not yet provided. Furthermore, our initial findings clearly indicate that additional services will be needed. We strongly urge that every dollar go for its original intention, the medical care of our rescue work workers. 25 million should immediately be transferred to this program. These dedicated firefighters and EMS work for workers rightfully deserve long-term health care and monitoring funding immediately. They deserve to be treated with the di dignity and dedication that they rightfully earned when they risked their lives and health while participating in the largest rescue and recovery effort in history. Thank you very much for your time. It would be my pleasure to answer any questions you have regarding this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Willis. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to thank the chair and the members of the committee for the opportunity to speak on these vital issues. My name is Jimmy Willis. I'm here on behalf of President Roger Toussaint and the 38,000 members of the Transport Workers Union Local 100, the subway and bus workers of the MTA New York City Transit, and most particularly on behalf of our 4,000 members who worked on the pile at Ground Zero. On the morning of September 11, 2001, as the Twin Towers burned, there were two evacuations in progress. One, of course, of the towers, 
was due to the heroic efforts of fire, police, and emergency response teams. The other evacuation took place in the subways and buses in, around, and under the Trade Center and was accomplished by transit workers. Due to the fact that the disaster occurred during rush hour, there were dozens of crowded buses in the area and approximately 200,000 passengers in the subway trains in the area. All of these passengers were safely evacuated without injury by transit workers. Hundreds of evacuations began simultaneously in the transit network around Ground Zero. Two of those evacuations are indicative of what transpired. In the minutes before the first collapse, train operator Hector Ramirez had instructions to bypass the World Trade Center by subway control. As his train entered the station, Ramirez saw hundreds of panicked, screaming passengers. Despite orders, he stopped his train. Ramirez and his conductor then evacuated everyone from the platform and took the train out of the station. That was the last train through before the towers collapsed. One block from the Trade Center, bus operator Franklin Chandra stood by with his bus in case he was needed. After the towers collapsed, Chandler did not leave his post. He searched through the debris for injured survivors, placed them on his bus until it was full, and drove them all to area hospitals. New York City Transit must be ready to rebuild and repair the largest subway system in the world. Thousands of Local 100 members are hard hats, welders, track workers, payload operators, carpenters, iron workers, etc. At approximately 11 a.m., on September 11th, all of transit's heavy equipment was mobilized to the Brooklyn waterfront and loaded on barges. Thousands of transit workers then sailed with the equipment to Manhattan and began the torturous process of digging through the pile. The U.S. Department of Transportation has recently released a report which states that the MTA played a critical role in the rescue effort at Ground Zero and in helping restore parts of the city's infrastructure, including communications. And at one point, MTA employees comprised 60% of the rescue force at Ground Zero. Unfortunately, this level of response has come at a terrible price. It is well documented that rescue workers were exposed to asbestos, mercury, lead, pulverized glass, and concrete, a virtual toxic soup. Transit workers toiled for weeks at Ground Zero without respirators. Unfortunately, New York City Transit, New York City Department of Health, and New York State deferred site air quality and safety to the EPA. Of the 4,000 transit workers who responded to Ground Zero, as many as half of us are now seriously ill. Thousands of other rescue workers are also ill. Most of us should not have been allowed to work at the site without appropriate personal protection. The investigation into the EPA Inspector General's report as well as the EPA's role with regards to ground zero air quality must be thoroughly and completely investigated. Local 100 members who were at ground zero are now suffering from respiratory disease, gastrointestinal disorders, and depression. The same afflictions are brothers and sisters from the fire department, police department, emergency service, and building trades are facing. I can attest to this. I worked with our welders at the site. As a result of my time spent at Ground Zero, I've been diagnosed with gastrointestinal disorders and lifelong respiratory disease. I am only one of many. We at Transit work for a state agency that is self-insured for workers' compensation and has, as a result, controverted every single case, comp case, arising out of Ground Zero. Among those cases is bus operator, the Reverend Franklin Chandler, who I previously mentioned and who saved so many lives on September 11th. When he filed for injuries arising out of his heroic work that day, he was termed a liar, malingerer, and fraud by transit. He and his family went eight months without a check until a compensation judge ruled in his favor. It is outrageous that men and women who risk their lives for their country and on behalf of others should be so callously treated. Local 100 President Roger Toussaint insisted the New York City Transit partner with us in a counseling program aimed at alleviating some of the trauma associated with Ground Zero among transit workers. I coordinated that program on the locals' behalf. After helping only 150 of the 4,000 members at Ground Zero, New York City Transit pulled out of the program once they became aware of its workers' comp implications. 
The issue of medical treatment and compensation arising out of work at ground zero and the cost associated with it should rightfully be borne at the federal level. Appropriations for this must come through Congress and be signed by the President. Many local 100 members have been seen by the staff at Mount Sinai World Trade Center Clinic. This program provides for initial and follow-up screenings and the program is federally funded. The medical and support staff at the Mount Sinai World Trade Clinic have been wonderful. My members continually praise the care they receive there. Any thought to reducing this primary source of care to make more available for satellite clinics is ill-advised. Rather, an increase in funding is called for. However, an increase in funding for screenings is not nearly enough. The members of my local are utilizing, they're utilizing their own medical benefits to cover the cost of actual care. In two years, when we begin contract negotiations with the MTA, they will point to the burdensome charges carried by our health plan, costs associated with ground zero work. The reality is that New York City Transit will seek to negotiate down our health benefits due directly to so many members utilizing care because of Ground Zero related illness. Those of us who responded to Ground Zero are in crisis. The response to that crisis on a state and federal level has been sorely lacking. Federal funds need to be allocated immediately to cover the cost of health care for those who sacrificed at Ground Zero. Additionally, the MTA a New York State agency needs to realize that those of us who responded to Ground Zero must have immediate access to our workers' compensation benefits without needless controversy. Finally, congressional leaders applauded the rescuers of Ground Zero. On September 13, 2001, President Bush appeared at Ground Zero and thanked us for being there when this country needed us. We asked the same thing, Mr. President. Those of us who were there when our country needed us are now in peril. Will you and Congress help us now that we're in need? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Willis. Mr. Graham. Thank you. Hold on once. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. We're all set. Hello. My name is John Graham. I'm a health and safety instructor and officer of the New York District Council of Carpenters. In addition, I am an emergency medical technician. I participated in the initial response, rescue, recovery, and cleanup operation at the World Trade Center site, beginning the morning of September 11th, ending May 30th, 2002. On the morning of September 11th, I reported to the World Trade Center site on behalf of the Carpenters Union as a safety officer to assist and aid my fellow carpenters who are working at the World Trade Center site, who might be in need of my assistance due to the initial plane crash. Upon reaching the scene, I was utilized by emergency personnel as an EMT. Stationed at the base of the North Tower, I witnessed the most horrific events I have ever seen in my life. The events that continue to haunt me to this day. I continued to perform my duties despite the appalling scene unfolding around before me until I was momentarily incapacitated by the collapse of the World Trade Center. With the collapse of the Twin Towers, I and those around me present on, this, on that day, and those who came to the scene in the days and weeks that followed became victims of the worst chemical exposure events in the history of the United States. On the day I was engulfed in a toxic cloud composed of, but not limited to, pulverized asbestos, lead, mercury, cadmium, PCBs, and benzene, which are known to be highly corrosive to human lungs. This cloud that contaminated much of Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn, unbeknownst to the innocent people living and working in the neighborhoods surrounding the World Trade Center site. My exposure to this toxic soup of carcinogenics continued throughout the 262 days I worked at the World Trade Center site. Almost immediately, I began to feel the ill effects of the exposure. In the moments after the cloud of the collapse of the World Trade Center began to clear, I and those around me, lucky enough to be alive, began to choke, gag, and vomit from the forced insulation of the toxic cloud. I had to rinse my face and eyes to try to find relief from the severe burning sensation I was feeling on my skin and eyes. Within two weeks of my initial exposure, I began to develop severe respiratory symptoms requiring medical attention. 
Knowing Dr. Stephen Levin of Mount Sinai Occupational Medical Center and his expertise in these medical chemical exposures on job site, I turned to him for his medical expertise. Since October 2001, I have been receiving treatment from Dr. Levin and his staff at Mount Sinai for my respiratory and other exposures resulting from the chemical exposure at the World Trade Center site. I have been diagnosed with and continue to suffer from RADS, reactive airway disease, a chronic form of asthma resulting from chemical <coughs> exposure at the World Trade Center site. My rescue inhaler is my constant companion. Despite the staff at Mount Sinai doing the best to help me with my medical problems as possible at this time. In addition to my medical problems, I have been and continue to suffer from <coughs> chronic post-traumatic -trauma stress disorder, for which I have been receiving treatment since October 2001. Prior to September 11th, I was a healthy, hardworking father, son, and husband. Today, I'm a chronically ill man who is anxious about my ability to support my family. I am no longer able to work as a carpenter. My chronic asthmatic condition makes it difficult for me to carry out my duties as a safety officer, father, son, and husband. I often have to stop my activities to use my inhaler to catch my breath. It breaks my heart not to be able to run and play with my two daughters as I once was able. I'm not alone in my ill effects. I am suffering from the chemical exposure on 9-11 and the days after. I am one of thousands. Despite the best treatment available, we continue to experience severe symptoms and more research is needed to understand the diseases we suffer from and the treatments that will effectively bring relief. I am not naive enough to think that anyone can cure us from our chemical exposure we have experienced, but some relief would be nice. 2,811 people were killed on September 11th. My greatest fear is that the number of fatalities from the World Trade Center attack will continue to rise as time goes on, and those of us exposed to this toxic soup begin to die off from the long-term effects of this deadly chemical exposure. It is only with the support of Martin Daly, my boss, and the National Institute of Environmental Health Scientists and the doctors and staff at Mount Sinai that I'm able to continue and function at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Mr. Rapp. Good morning, committee, members of Mount Sinai, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Rapp. I'm a construction worker with the local 1456 Block Builders District Council of Carpenters. I was, I was at ground zero for near five months. I was at ground zero for near five months, including three days of the first week of the terrorist attack. I hope my testimony is going to make everyone aware of what we experienced at ground zero and what I and others are going through now. I viewed, smelled, handled things that you could not imagine. Although I work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, I look forward to heading back for another shift. I started experiencing health problems like dizziness, shortness of breath, and skin rash while I was still working down there. Although we accomplished what we set out to do, which is keeping the slurry wall from collapsing as the debris was removed. Our job was installing tiebacks while being exposed to who knows what. My job was completed in March of 2002 at Ground Zero. I went to my next job at Kennedy Airport driving piles for American Airlines where my ability and stamina had diminished. I was laid off the first week of April and have not worked since. I'm a 42-year-old dock builder that normally could do as much as a 22-year-old and more. I could carry a 150-pound tank of oxygen or acetylene to a half a block to a rough job site, but now I can't even take out my household garbage. I'm also an mechan auto mechanic with five certifications after a long day of dock building, I could still come home and install a 200-pound transmission on my back, off my chest. Now I can't even change a flat tire. There's a lot of fear in my life now. I've had several emergency visits, 
several short stays in the hospital. I rely on oxygen at night to, to sleep, and I still wake up sometimes gasping for air, trying to stay calm. Sometimes I feel like I'm underwater. I've had a sore throat for 15 months now. When I cough, I can feel the outlines of my lungs. I sleep on a recliner, straight up. I can't go out in the humidity or breathe cold air. I need to keep my house at a 65 degree temperature where my wife sleeps with a quilt. I'm on steroids which have caused weight gain. I've put on 50 pounds since I've stopped working in April of 2002, which probably doesn't help my condition, but the steroids do help. I'm on 12 other different uh, medications, plus three types of inhalers, and I carry an oxygen tank wherever I go for assistance to breathe. I can't tell you how hard it is living like this. I fear of not being able to get my next breath is unbearable. I'm going to two different doctors at this time. One is a Dr. Leo Pons, and the other is Mount Sinai Health for Heroes. Mount Sinai has been great to me. They've been helping me since November 2002. They helped me get immediate benefits from workers' compensation, most importantly with the medications that I rely on to breathe. All of this staff have been compassionate and expressed real concern for my future. They always make sure I have enough medication. I'd like to end this with, I have a beautiful wife of 27 years and two sons in their 20s that fear for my future as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rapp, for um, your testimony. Thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. Uh, I am going to um, call on Mr. Owens uh, who has joined us. He is a very active member of the full committee. Uh, and then it's my intention to recognize for questions uh, Ms. Maloney, uh, then Mr. Turner, then Mr. Towns, then Mr. Owens, then Mr. Nadler, and then myself. Uh, the usual procedure in Congress is that we have five minutes of questions. Uh, this subcommittee uh, prefers 10 because uh, you can fo have better follow up. We're going to just set the clock at seven minutes, Bob. Uh, and at this time, though, Mr. Owens, this is not your question time, but if you'd like to make a statement, uh, we welcome that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by thanking you and uh, as Chairman and my colleague, uh, Carolyn Maloney, for putting forth the effort to make this hearing possible. Uh, on April 28th uh, this year, uh, in response to a request by the Central Labor Council under Brian McLaughlin and the New York Committee for Occ on Occupational Safety and Health, headed by Jack Joel Shufro, uh, we held uh, a, an unofficial hearing, Carolyn Maloney and I, here in New York on that work on Memorial Day, April 28th. And that was uh, several months before the EPA Inspector General issued his report. Uh, I see uh, at least uh, uh, three of the people who testified at that hearing. I want to thank them for their past testimony and for their testimony uh, here today. Uh, we, we are making headway at a very sh slow pace, <laughs> but I think that uh, we are bringing uh, the, uh, the attention to the fact that uh, what happened 9-11 highlights something unfortunate about our government. It says that certain governmental agencies have no respect for uh, residents and citizens and, and workers. They, they may even have contempt for them. We have a government that proposes now to bring justice to Iraq, after liberating them, they're going to provide a just society and a just government. But here, the justice does not include taking care of the workers who are suffering now in this country as a result of being victimized by an act of war. It was an act of war. And many of our colleagues in Congress seem to think that New York is asking for something special when it asks for this kind of help. But it was an act of war. Uh, they were not targeting the World Trade Center because it was in New York State or New York City, they were targeting, they targeted the World Trade Center because it was a target of the United States. That was a target of the terrorists. One of the ways that we must move at the state and city level, along with the congressional delegation and the two senators from New York, is to keep insisting that the World Trade Center wa tragedy was a result of an act of war against the United States of America. The, the people of New York State and New York City should not be asked to suffer unduly are to bear the cost of writing all the things that have gone wrong as a result of September 11. It was an act of war. Homeland security becomes a farce if we're going to treat the people 
who are on the front lines of Homeland Security with contempt. And this situation shows that they are being treated with contempt. We like to see workers and all those workers, all those who support workers, begin to scream louder and in a more continuous fashion to get this injustice corrected. In the war against terrorism, workers are going to be warriors, whether they like it or not. They are warriors. Workers must be recognized and rewarded as heroes. Certainly, workers should receive the best medical care possible. And I ask you now to consent to uh, in a, a more expanded station, it, uh, you, statement sir. into the record with documentation. That, that will, uh, without objection, so ordered, it will be done. Uh, this um, hearing I is not, uh, again, going to answer every question that's raised. Uh, I'm going to ask for uh, the <coughs> support of this committee to make sure that we don't waste the opportunity with the witnesses we have to look at the call of the hearing. And the call is, what is known about the short and long-term health effects of September 11th attack on those who worked at Ground Zero and live there today? And how effective are the steps taken by the federal and local government to investigate health effects and provide treatment for those injured? We're interested in knowing, uh, to start with, at this hearing, uh, next hearing we'll expand it, but we want to know um, uh, what is the health condition of, of those who were working on Ground Zero? What type of diagnosis, treatment, compensation? And uh, we don't want to waste the opportunity to, to learn the answers to these questions. Uh, I realize some members are going to uh, ask some questions that we may not have answers for. I, I felt very strongly that members should have an opportunity in their opening statements to address an issue much wider than this hearing, put it on the record, challenge the committee to deal with this issue uh, during the course of our hearings, and, and I think that is the challenge that we need to accept. At this time, Ms. Maloney, I recognize you for seven minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank all the panelists, and I thank especially my colleagues for their ongoing support of efforts uh, to help the victims, the rescue workers, and everyone with 9-11. With and uh, you've raised uh, many, many issues that, are, uh, that we need to address. I, I find it startling that we didn't have the proper equipment to protect people and that we still don't have the proper equipment to protect people in the event of a disaster. But I, I have uh, two questions that I'd like to ask the entire panel. And first of all, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand if you think the federal government can do more than uh, it is doing to, to help the, the workers, rescue workers and others because of the effects of 9-11. Raise your hand if you think we should be doing more. Uh, for the transcriber, all our witnesses, including uh, Dr. Levin, has uh, responded in the affirmative. And then I'd like each of you very briefly, because you could use up all of my seven minutes and I don't want it all used up, can you tell me very briefly what it is you feel the federal government should be doing, and we're going to start with Dr. Let's start with Dr. Herbert and go right down to Mr. Rapp. What, what more could we be doing to be helpful? Very briefly. I'll defer to Dr. Levin. Levin. Okay, very quickly because I know time is short. Excuse me, the mic. The issue has been addressed by several of the panel members. Number one, there is a terrible need for treatment resources. I think the witnesses here, the workers who were affected, make quite clear that um, the resources available now really are a patchwork of a broken workers' compensation system and philanthropic funding, as well as people's private insurance or out of pocket. And this is no way, from a public health perspective, for the federal gov government to address what is clearly a public health need. For people to have to jump through the hoops of a workers' compensation system that put, sets up barriers to their getting through that system and getting actual treatment benefits, wage replacement, is an outrage, um, given what these people have done. Number two, we need adequate funding for follow-up evaluations of this population. Those who have been screened already have exhibited high rates of respiratory problems, high rates of psychological distress. We need to follow them in the short run, and we're grateful that $56 million out of the $90 million now can be used for the follow-up of this group of responders. That's enough to cover perhaps five or six years of examinations. It will require a great deal more funding to follow them for the minimum of 20 years they should be followed 
not only because we will learn something important scientifically about what the consequences of exposure might be, but because people who may develop these longer range illnesses need to have these illnesses identified when they are treatable. That means the earliest detection possible. I don't have time to say much more. I will say only that we need also a more comprehensive, coordinated response in general should there be an event like this in the future so that we're not playing catch up and doing our first screening examinations 10 months after an event. I'll be brief. Three issues that the federal government, uh, we, we would urge to do more. First is to fully fund the WTC health registry in the out years. There's a funding gap of $2 million a year for 20 years. Second, as all of the panel has called, resources for referral and medical care for those affected by 9-11 are needed. They are not sufficient as they currently exist. These, this is a uh, national tragedy that happened. The expenses are being borne by the city and by the workers and by the individuals who are affected. The federal government should step up to the plate and provide those referral and treatment resources. And third, in terms of future effects, to prioritize New York City uh, please don't play politics with preparedness. We know that most of the risk is to New York City. We have many needs for preparedness which are not yet met. We need increased resources to meet those needs. So uh, I implore you to break the bureaucratic logjam that is preventing money that has already been allocated from setting up ongoing health monitoring. I am one of the two pulmonologists working for the fire department. I routinely say goodbye to people after they've gotten their disability retirements, and I say, wait for a letter from us stating where and when you should show up for your long-term monitoring. There is no such letter being sent out. There is no place to bring these people back. And the longer the gap between our ability to monitor them and care for them and some place that they can centrally be cared for, the more people will fall in between that gap. I, I just have four items, and basically I believe that the government should provide long-term monitoring care for our members. They also need to provide long-term treatment for our members, not just uh, monitoring, but treatment and also long-term care for our members. Because the fourth item that I just want to mention is that the government has a responsibility to show the rest of the nation that if they follow a good template for taking care of the people in New York, they can take care of the rest of the country the same way. If they don't establish a good template for taking care of people here, there is going to be no confidence in government in the future at taking care of these catastrophic events. Mr. Willis. Thank you. Uh, first, federal appropriations for long-term treatment and care is a must. And frankly, with respect to Ground Zero, the state comp process should be taken out of it. It should really be a federal function. And Congresswoman Maloney, I couldn't agree with you more. If these issues aren't taken care of now, if we have another disaster, we're going to be hurting finding people to respond. Uh, my issue is I think that sooner or later I will be disabled and the health coverage for myself is an issue and for my family. I am a sole provider for my family on health coverage. And if I do go out on disability, besides for the one third less salary I'll be bringing home, I will not have any health benefits for my two daughters who are nine and five. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I too, like Mr. Graham, uh, I'm so supporter and um, I believe that we should be covered and for the future. Instead of sending billions of dollars over to other countries and stuff like that, we should be taken care of as a priority. Thank you. Well, would you be uh, surprised, uh, Mr. Rapp and Mr. Graham, uh, who have been working on uh, and receiving um, workman's comp, that the state of New York got $175 million to help, to help pay for workers' compensation. And, uh, uh, but you but you seem to be having trouble getting this money, uh, Mr. Willis, even though the money was appropriated by the federal government, the $175 million. Uh, and you're, I guess he's telling me my time is up, but if you could. No, no answer the question. If you could, you, if you're, in other words, we sent 
the $175 million, and you're saying you're having trouble getting it out of workman's compensation, we could, should just abolish the program and go straight to the feds. But if, if you could explain, they're turning down people like yourselves that risk your lives to save others. Could you elaborate a little bit? Because this has got to be addressed. We've got to get the money to the people who sacrifice their lives. And I've got to say, Mr. Graham and Mr. Rapp, uh, if you do go out on disability and you lose not only your income, to lose your health insurance is, is just uh, awful. And at the very least, the federal government should uh, provide the health uh, protection for those of you who risked your lives. I, I thank all of you on behalf of my constituents in my city uh, for your brave efforts. But could you respond to that? We, in fact, we sent the money. So where, what's the problem? They're not processing it? Okay, uh, with regards to transit workers, we work for a state agency. New York City Transit is self-insured for workers' compensation. Uh, as such, it's a budgetary process for them. Every dollar they spend on comp is a dollar out of their budget. They're holding a uh, meeting today telling the people of the city of New York how broke they are. It's outrageous that every comp case for a state agency has been controverted. We've got people who were down at ground zero who have been fired because they were not, they were section 71 by the state. One, Why for instance, is a section 71. Okay, section 71, if you have more than 12 months off out of work mm -hmm. on a comp case or on an injury or on an illness, mm -hmm. the state can seek to terminate you. And they have. Mm -hmm. In one case, I know of a welder who was at ground zero, was one of our transit workers, and some of you may remember in the first days, mm -hmm. The, as horns went off when they thought there'd be building collapses, this guy was knocked down, he had a knee replacement, was not able to get back to work, he's been fired. Mm -hmm. He's not alone, okay? This is a state agency. Well, uh, we will follow up on that. My time is up. I thank the chairman and he pointed Mr. out Rapp a Mr. Need. Graham, why don't we respond? Mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. speak on my own behalf, my workman's comp case has been convoluted. Uh, Controversy. Controversy, thank you. So that's, my, I know that what that means, but it means that they're not what paying. What does it, for the record, what does it mean? Convert? It means that they're uh, arguing my case, that they're not actually. They're contesting. They're disputing. They're, 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 they're disputing. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, fair enough. Let's mm -hmm. get on. How much time did we use on this question? Uh, totally, how much did we use? Oh. What does the clock say? Uh, Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Turner, you have the floor. Thank you. I, I want to thank all the members of, of the panel for the spirit in which that they're approaching this. I appreciate Mr. Owen's statement that this is an, an act of war against our country and that the individuals who have been impacted this have been impacted by a, a national catastrophe and an act of war. And Mrs. Maloney's statement that this is a, an issue that has bipartisan support because certainly the nation's response to this was on a nonpartisan basis, so certainly our analysis of how we go forward is, is also bipartisan and nonpartisan. When Mrs. Maloney asked the question of how many people on, on the panel I think that the federal government could do more, um, I, I wish she'd allowed us to raise our hands too because I would have joined you, Mrs. Maloney, in, in saying that the federal government can, can, can absolutely do more. The question that we have obviously before us is do more of, of what? And so it, it's not a neglect of the federal government that, that there isn't a, an action um, that of our list of things that we could do. This is the process that we go through, the deliberative process of making certain that we do the things that are best and that, that those get implemented. Uh, I really appreciated the information on, you know, what are the things that, that, that we need to do and that the, the gap of treatment and making certain that individuals that don't have um, access to treatment receive it, the information of follow-up and the coordinating of response. I think we all want to make certain that the heroes of 9-11 get the attention and response that they need, but our concern is that the bureaucracies of 9-11 also get the oversight that they need. Um, in looking at the issue of the amount of um, long-term uh, health uh, monitoring um, in the information, the testimony that's been provided to us, uh, some of the money has been released, some of the money has not yet been released, but we have already on the federal government uh, allocated and some spent $122 million for assessment and for registry and for screening. That's not a small amount. And the ask that we get today 
is that that amount be extended in 20-year programs and then looking at what that amount will, will be. Um, my, my questions are, are, are twofold. Uh, one, as I acknowledged in my comments, you know, mine was a community that responded to the call from New York City to send EMS and firefighters in as part of the recovery effort that's here. So my first question is, to what extent uh, does, does the uh, fire registry program, um, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Mount Sinai's efforts go beyond uh, just the individuals that currently are in the area, but those that were impacted that came in? And secondly, I would really like um, some discussion specifically between Mr. Friedman and uh, Dr. Herbert and Mr. McArdle concerning the coordination of these programs, because you know, we're, when you get to 122 million and, and you're, you're just beginning to scratch the surface and you're each talking about 20-year programs and the annual amounts to, to uh, maintain them, to what extent are the, your processes being coordinated? Let me start with Dr. Herbert. Well, actually, because Dr. Levin and I are co-directors, we'd agreed, we'd agreed that I would give testimony and he would respond to questions, if that's okay. She left the tough job to me. <laughs> well, n number one, we have worked very well with the fire department's medical group and have compared notes and findings and approaches to the monitoring and evaluation um, of our respective groups really from the beginning. And what was so striking to us early on was how similar the findings among the fire um, fighters were to what we were seeing among the other rescue and recovery workers. So we, we in, the, in going forward, are very likely to be able to work out common screening protocols so that we may even at some point be able to share data in a common database. And this will be important, I think, to understand better what the clinical consequences were and how the, what are the best approaches to treatment. Um, so far as the other question, the national scope of our program, we were mandated by NIOSH when we received a contract to establish a consortium of institutions to provide these screening examinations to cover all of those people nationwide who had come to New York and then returned to their home cities to do rescue and recovery work here at Ground Zero. And we are doing this through the coordination of the Association of Occupational and Environmental Clinics, a network of public health oriented clinics throughout the country, and they are going to have provi provided by the end of this program some 1,000 examinations um, at cities located geographically pretty well distributed across the country. Um, and in fact, in Ohio, I just spoke with the director of the program at University of Cincinnati, um, who's seen some of the people in, in Ohio. Um, it's not enough. There are people we are afraid will not be covered. For example, the federal employees who are paid with federal dollars to do their rescue and recovery work are not covered by our program. State employees are not either. Unfortunately, unlike the state employees here in New York, there is still no program for, federally, um, fe for federal employees who came to Ground Zero. There is no screening program, no monitoring program going forward. I think, again, if we're talking about public health mistakes, this is clearly another public health mistake. Let me just say, uh, Bob, I want to give 10 minutes to each member. We're going to end up using it anywhere. So add three to the. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. In terms of the uh, extent of the registry, anyone who meets the eligibility criteria can enroll. We've already had enrollees from dozens of states, including several dozen individuals from Ohio. And so it's available for any who were in the groups that were most exposed to enroll. In addition, the results of the registry will be relevant not only for those who participate and not only though for those who meet the criteria for enrollment, but also for others who had lesser levels of exposure. It will allow us to generalize. It's the only evaluation that can put into context the clinical findings and give us the overall picture. In terms of coordination, I think there's excellent coordination. Uh, we're on the advisory committee of, of the Sinai Group. They're on our advisory committee. We coordinate frequently. We, uh, we consult each other uh, when issues arise. And uh, we're looking at having different pieces of the puzzle which will allow us to give the most comprehensive overview of what are the impacts, which are the groups at highest risks, what are the conditions that are most problematic, and uh, as we learn more, what are the treatments that are most, affected, most effective for those who had been affected the most? Mr. McCarter. Uh, I think that uh, the points that I want to make is that 
we do have some coordination but not complete coordination i believe that we we communicate regularly with the people at mount sinai we communicate our labor union communicates with our medical office and i believe that in the end what will actually happen is that the data that's collected by the new york city fire department will be the very best data available on what happened and this is the reason why our people from the day they start employment in new york city fire department get a medical annually because of hazardous materials regulations and because of that we have data knowing what everybody's medical condition was pre 9 11. the postal and and this is why it is so important not to uh not to hold back on the money from the fdny our money was sole sourced and we believe that what, what's happening in this in this battle for the rest of the money you're neglecting a very important portion of the information that's going to be of value to the entire nation down the road. It, it's imperative that, that the, our fire department get the $25 million right away. And there is a lot of government haggling about, about the money. And we, need, we absolutely need that to stop. Dr. Wyden on the issue of coordination. Um, so I, I think that because of the organization of our occupational health facility, we will be leading indicators. And um, we are dedicated both to collecting the information, disseminating the information in an academic channel. We have now published, I think, four articles, which I think were the first. I think that we will continue to find things, publish, publish them, get them out there, and uh, be a light for everybody else. So I would urge um, that you support us as a, as a separate entity, and we will then disseminate the information. Mr. Willis? On the issue of coordination from the registries and... No answer. I think we need more research and more coordination from more departments to find out what, what medications might work, what treatments might work. Right. If someone comes up with more ideas of a treatment that might relieve some of the problems that we're all experiencing, if that could come down and, and people could join together and find out. We need research. We need somebody to find out. Right now, my medication just keeps me at this point. I'm not tremendously getting better. I'm not getting tremendously worse. I need to find something that would a cure, relief, something. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. At this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by first um, uh, commending the outstanding work that you're doing here at Mount Sinai. I noticed that was one thing that everybody sort of agreed on at the table, and I'd also like to uh, associate myself with those remarks. Uh, <clears throat> let me um, ask, and Dr. Herbert, you've indicated that the question should go to Dr. Levin, right? Yes. Okay, all right, fine. So Dr. Levin, as the medical director of Mount Sinai said, the early WTC-related illnesses are detected and treated, the more likely the treatment will prevent long-term illness and disability. Given this, it makes sense to me to expand the list of people who should be included in screenings to make sure that every adversely affected one is checked. Maybe you pay a little more upfront to detect problems, but you save money and people's lives in the long run. Do you agree with the logic? Yes, I certainly do. And uh, I think that's been our approach from the very start. Um, we, we saw people being taken off that pile within the first couple of days, gasping for breath, choking, um, and, and could predict at that time that there would be a great deal of potential um, longer-term effects of, uh, with respiratory problems, upper respiratory problems, and lower respiratory problems. But in our clinical center, our Center for Occupational and Environmental Medicine, before our screening program began, we were seeing community residents. We were seeing people who had returned to office space down in Lower Manhattan for whom this screening program is not intended. Those people suffered respiratory illnesses as well. 
Do I believe that the federal government should have developed a program to evaluate those people who came back to work in the area, who came back to occupy residential space in the area, the school children who came back to school so early? Yes, I do. I think it's from a public health perspective, that would have been the correct thing to do. I still think it's worth doing. Right. Uh, Dr. Frieden, how do you feel about that? Certainly, early detection and effective treatment of conditions related to WTC is something that can minimize future impact. Right. Well, let me say this. On August 26, 2002, following the Newsday article, Winds of 911, little scrutiny for Brooklyn for attacks, toxic smoke drifted. I wrote to you expressing my concerns about leaving Brooklyn residents out who may have been exposed to WTC toxins out of the World Trade Registry. Given the additional research performed, which shows that the intense heat of ground zero blew the pollutants upwards, creating a loft effect causing these pollutants to blow towards Brooklyn and dropped on my constituents, do you think that it might be worth reconsidering now whether Brooklyn residents should be eligible for the registry? Uh, let, me, let me clarify several things. First, the services available for evaluation, medical evaluation and treatment are not related to participation or to eligibility for participation in the registry. So whether or not someone is eligible to participate in the registry and whether or not they do actually participate in the registry has no bearing on the services available to them. The same services will be or will not be available to them in either case. Uh, as it is, there are, in our estimate, close to 400,000 people who would be eligible for participation in the registry. Uh, given that, our focus is to focus on those most heavily exposed so that we have the best possible chance of documenting what the health impacts were and the extent of those impacts. There's no harm to opening the registry up for more people who would want to participate. However, it is not currently funded for a broader group of individuals who are not among those who are in the most intensely exposed individuals. If resources were available, we would not in any way be opposed to allowing people from Brooklyn or from, for example, between Canal and Chambers, which is also not in the eligibility now of the registry, to participate. They're undoubtedly exposed. We're not saying that they're not exposed. What we're saying is that given the extent of the exposure, the heaviest exposed groups are those that are currently eligible for enrollment. Uh, if resources were to allow, we would have no objection to having additional people eligible to be enrolled. And when you say additional resources, you know, because you know, what are you really talking about? It, it costs, to be frank about it, it costs about $100 per person who enrolls in the registry. We're currently funded to, uh, to allow the uh, enrollment of as many people as are eligible from within that most heavily exposed group. This, from a scientific perspective, we do feel will allow us to make conclusions about all of the groups, not just those who are most heavily exposed, not just people who are participating, but also others, including those from Brooklyn. And I would also uh, comment that many people from Bro Brooklyn do fall within an exposure category. We already have uh, thousands, I think more than a thousand or thousands of Brooklyn residents who are part of the registry, as we also have thousands of people who are from the unions who are part of the registry. We've had a very good response, and uh, we continue to encourage people to participate so that we have the best possible uh, chance of documenting and evaluating the population-based long-term health impacts. I think the reason I'm at raising this question, as you know, the Newsday article indicated that you, from the photo, you actually could see in terms of uh, uh, this cloud up in the sky and that was dropping in over Brooklyn. So that's the point I'm making. So the point is that if that you know, is a situation, it seems to me we should have a great interest in trying to find out more about that, you know, being we're trying to get as much knowledge as we possibly can. And it's been indicated by Mount Sinai that early detection makes a lot of sense. So it seemed to me that we would want to devote some of our resources and energy into trying to make certain that we find out this information as soon as we possibly can in order to prevent long-term disability and all kinds of other things that might occur if we do not do this. 
based on the best available atmospheric data, analyses of the plume, analyses of exposure, we feel that the current exposure groups for the registry do represent those individuals most heavily exposed to uh, and most at risk for potential health effects of 9-11. Right. Well, you know, um, uh, I just want to make certain that, you know, we do not leave Brooklyn out. Uh, let me just sort of move on to coordination point. I think that's a very interesting point. Do you, running down the table, you think of anything that needs to be done that might assist in the coordination? Because I think that coordination is very, very important because we're not talking about unlimited resources. Yes. Well, I, I'll comment on that. Yes, I think the coordination should have been in place from the very start of this terrible event. You know, and going forward, should there be another disaster, whether it's a terrorist attack or some other natural disaster, we need certain things in place. And that includes, for example, an independent, already identified panel of experts, uh, environmental health experts, who could be convened rapidly to assess the hazards and the likely health consequences and clinical effects of these exposures. When I say independent, I mean independent of political and economic considerations. Not that they won't come into play at some point, but in the deliberations of that expert panel, they should not be influenced by politics and by money considerations as they consider the issues of health consequence and the decisions made to protect people's health. You need, in such an event, you need a rapid, comprehensive registration of everybody who was down there. And as much as it was the Wild West, surely we could have done better in trying to capture who was down at that site. And that may occur in the future, the necessity to try to register people quickly. You need the rapid distribution of respirators. You need the rapid training of people to wear respirators. A number of people here have come to, talked about that issue, how late it was in getting adequate respiratory protection to people who really needed it. You need the rapid establishment of health evaluation and treatment capability, including a fast-track mechanism of funding from the federal government to institutions that can provide this kind of evaluation so that we won't be in the position, again, of waiting eight, ten months a year before people get their first evaluation after they've been ill you know, now for at least that period of time. Yes, we need coordination. The coordination has to be immediately in response to the event. And then all those institutions and agencies that are involved in trying to provide a public health response have to be working together under some coordinating unit. Right. Any other comments on, on coordination? Because I think that is very, very important. Yes. Actually, Mr. Uh, at that time, at that day, I lived in Brooklyn. Uh, on the morning of September 12th, my wife and daughter woke up to think that there was a fire in the house. What they were smelling was the cloud coming down from ground zero. At that time, we lived by the foot of the Verrazano Bridge, which is down in Bay Ridge, what, 10 miles away. And they thought there was a fire in our house. Uh, and in terms of coordination, I think that federal agencies simply need to recognize that there is an issue here, and they have to wake up and give help now. Thank you. Doctor. So, I'm an academic, and on the academic model, one of the ways of assuring coordination and transparency is a series of annual meetings um, with all of the stakeholders participating where the current results are presented in public. And I think that that would go very far to assuring the various constituencies here that everything that can be done is being done, that the money is well spent, and disseminate the information um, beyond the specialized centers to the broad constituencies with regard to care. Right. And Mr. Chairman, I have enough time for Mac, Mr. Michael Otto to answer. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, just a few issues. Uh, as far as coordination goes, I think that one of the important things is to make sure that when we have these types of events, that there is compliance with federal safety regulations. Uh, clearly, they were not followed on 9-11. I know a lot of the uh, rules went out the window. But labor, labor organizations, for the good, uh, good part of the early operations, were basically ignored. And some of their concerns about their members' health was ignored. And now we're paying the consequences for that right now. 
And I think the strict safety discipline at these in, uh, events in the future are, is also going to be important to prevent long-term exposure issues and, and long-term medical problems. I'd just like to say very briefly that at the City Health Department, we have a total commitment to openness and transparency. We're clear about what we know, what we don't know, what studies we've done, what they've found. I think at the, uh, at the general level, federal, state, local, there are many very controversial issues. Uh, particularly environmental issues are controversial. In regard to environmental issues, there's a great deal of suspicion. There's a great deal of lack of knowledge. And it would serve the public best if there were a combination of complete openness and, uh, as was called for before, a kind of independent, impeccably respected, scientifically valid group to look at what we know already, what we don't know already, and determine what more we might need to know. Because there have actually been an enormous number of studies done, uh, some of them done superbly by uh, groups here at this panel, some of them by others. There is, in fact, an enormous amount of environmental uh, data available. And so I think it's important that we have the mechanism to look at that openly, transparently, hearing from everyone and be being clear about what we know, what we don't, and what more we need to know. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Owens, Major Owens, you have the floor. Uh, let me begin with one narrow question to follow up on my colleague, Mr. Towns's question. We're both concerned about uh, the fact that residents of Cobble Hill, Brooklyn Heights, and Park Slope, who incidentally lost a number of lives in, in the uh, World Trade Center, I think they've been ab abandoned and deserted in terms of concerns about the pollution and the impact there. Uh, in your determination of the areas that you would focus on, were there any uh, criteria other than budgetary uh, ones that determine how broad, uh, how wide your scope would be, how big your catchment area would be? Let me reiterate that there is no less attention to those who are exposed in any area. The World Trade Center Health Registry does not enable people to get more health services nor does it restrict health services from any other groups. It is an attempt to systematically document so that we can generalize about the people who were exposed and identify what syndromes are associated with exposure to WTC. Many residents from Brooklyn have already enrolled. We hope that many more will enroll. In determining which were the most heavily exposed groups, we did not look at budgetary issues at all. We looked at what the exposures were. And the exposures related to residents, they related to presence, they related obviously to rescue and, and recovery operations, uh, both in WTC and uh, at the Fresh Kills landfill where there was exposure directly to the potentially toxic uh, 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 materials that were involved in the WTC. Residents in uh, Lower Manhattan um, are so all included. So the mostly geographical land, you know, both Prom, uh, you know, if they're in proximity to the site, uh, no, nobody went out and took any measurements in Brooklyn along the no, water. <laughs> actually, extensive. Uh, to extensive, find out how much uh, right. debris Ex had dropped there. Extensive analysis of the plume was done, and um, in no way are we saying there was not exposure in Brooklyn. However, all of the evidence that we have re reviewed does indicate that the exposure, that the plume, fell most heavily in Lower Manhattan. Thank you. I see that uh, a representative of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health was scheduled at one point to testify here. Uh, yeah. no. Panel two. Panel two. Oh, well, I'll, I'll save this for panel two then. Uh, I was going to well, I'll ask you, uh, any one of you, what kind of role have you seen OSHA play in this? drama from beginning to end. Would you make to, like to make any significant comments as to the role of OSHA? Yes. OSHA uh, was there very early on. Uh, they helped myself. They helped myself and many other workers there. Uh, it was a tough job they were put into. There's no real regulations that state what do you do when a 110-story building collapses? How do you handle it? Um, extremely enforceful. They mandated that anyone on the job site not complying was removed. Uh, my administration complied to that. They uh, 
a lot of due diligence on OSHA's part there, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to uh, do the best job they could. Uh, what has been your experience at Mount Sinai with OSHA? Any significant? Well, we have many colleagues and friends who are on the ground, so to speak, working with OSHA, um, trying to determine levels of exposure, trying to ensure respiratory protection. Th th there was one clear arena of debate, and that is OSHA was not in enforcement mode. They were in a consultative mode. There was a partnership between, uh, between the contractors and the unions to enforce safe, safety regulations on the job. And if you look at the actual accident rates, and the fact that not one fatality occurred on that site, clearly that the fatality, uh, the accident rates were half of what would have been expected on a comparable demolition or construction site with that many person hours worked. Nevertheless, the fact that OSHA was not in enforcement mode did mean that some of those workers out there on the pile were not wearing adequate respiratory protection and there was not full enforcement requiring that they do so. And that was a price that was paid in the health consequences for people who were there. I do not fault those hardworking OSHA people that we have worked with for so long for their efforts because they tried very hard to do the right thing. The policy question of whether that was the right way to go, I think, is still a, a, a remaining subject for debate and discussion. Are you getting cooperation from them now that's compensatory to what they had to do then? We. In our screening program, we have worked most clo closely with NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, which is sort of the research arm under the CDC. And we have worked very well with our colleagues at NIOSH. Um, our only complaint is we'd like to see this funding come through for long-term medical monitoring fast enough so that we won't be stuck in a situation where there's a gap between the current screening program and the future longer-term monitoring. But in the development of the medical protocol and how to think about these issues. We've worked very well with NIOSH and found the experience with them to be very helpful. My final question is a little more, a little broader. Uh, the federal government is to be congratulated, the administration and both parties, for what the steps it took to deal with the casualties, the, the victims at the World Trade Center, uh, the way the uh, insurance and the compensation has been handled, I think uh, is, is outstanding. Uh, you know, uh, I voted for it, so I take some credit. Uh, but it was unprecedented. Is it not possible to deal with workers on the site and their problems in the same kind of way? Under one umbrella, make some decisions about who's to be compensated for what and what, what kind of care who's entitled to uh, and for how long and what kind of damages, uh, you know, uh, people do compensation for is, is that undoable? We deal with a finite number of people. I'm not talking about residents. I'm talking about workers who were there on the site, most of whom can, who can prove that they're on site. Uh, uh, is it not possible to, to look at some kind of bigger, more comprehensive program which would deal with all these problems and not have to uh, nickel and dime it uh, and then beg your way through philanthropy and uh, agency uh, <laughs> generosity here and there? Well, if you're asking, us at Mount Sinai. I'm asking everybody who might want to comment, yes. Well, <laughs> we certainly feel it ought to be possible because the actual experience of people who responded down there, whether they were workers or volunteers, has been absolutely awful. I mean, you heard from people today what it's like trying to get through this broken workers' compensation system. This system wasn't broken just after 9-11. It was broken before. It's just, it's quite stark now that you have people who did so much down there to help others. Who yeah, but who there was no system for the insurance the payment of people who lost their relatives there. We created a system yes, afterwards. Right. And that's what I'm talking about. Can we not create a system which then will then become a model for the future in terms of uh, situations like this, instead of trying to put it together with uh, I, rubber I bands and, and, and gum? I certainly think that w uh, such a system could be developed. I think the experience that we at Mount Sinai and others who have provided care to such workers and volunteers could help develop such a system. It would be rational and it would be able to put in, in place a mechanism for getting people treatment, further studies that they absolutely need without their having to go through the nightmare of trying to get some workers' comp insurance company to say yes to this after a year and a half has passed and still nothing has been done. Yes, Thank we you. could develop a system. Thank you for putting that on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Ladder. Uh, Jerry Ladder, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, um, just to follow up on the workers' comp for a moment, Commissioner Frieden, 
You've heard here that the MTA has controverted, which is a state agency, has controverted that has disputed every single workers' comp case arising out of the World Trade Center catastrophe. Has the city administration uh, done anything to speak to the governor or the state or the MTA about this disgraceful practice? I'm not familiar with that situation, but we could certainly find out okay. about it and, and uh, I mean, get information back. In other words, all these employees of government agencies, every single case, the MTA says, the government says, you may be a hero in 9-11, but you're a malingerer, you're a liar, you're a phony false claimer. Every single case. I find that disgraceful. I find it disgraceful for the state government. I find it, frankly, disgraceful that the city government um, hasn't done anything about it, um, number one. Number two, uh, Mr. McArdle, Mr. Willis, Mr. Graham, Mr. Rapp, um, when you were working on the pile, did, were you wearing respirators? I was, yes. The entire time? Yes. And you still have all these health effects? Uh, I'm, I'm not one of the people who's uh, oh. impacted by it. Okay. Mr. Willis? No, I had a paper mask. I'm sorry? I had a paper mask. Not a respirator? No. Uh, were you offered a respirator? I'm sorry? Do were you offered a respirator? No. None were available. None were available. Did you ask for one? No. But, no. but you, were, you were made aware that none was available? Right. There was, yeah. There was no one around me at that time in the first you know, few days that I saw where we were working who had them. And this was just the first few days. What about right. after the first few after days? After that, you know, as some of our, some of our people in transit who were respirator qualified. Uh, were, were respirator qualified? Qualif with? Right. You have to be qualified for a fit. And if you, you mean physically qualified? Right. Yes. Yeah. For, for instance, with a beard, you're not. And if you weren't qualified, for, they didn't tell you to shave off your beard. They said, go work there without the respirator? The, that question didn't even come up. It was we were ordered there, and a lot of us actually volunteered. I, for instance, volunteered. But people, but respirators were or were not available after the first few days? No, 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 no. They were not. A, the, first of all, transit doesn't even have that quantity of respirators to cover the thousands of hard hats that they had there. So people in transit worked for weeks on the pile without respirators, and no one made any attempts so far as you were aware to get them respirators? In a, I mean, we had bus operators, for instance, the firemen, for the most part, were brought down to the site from Canal Street by our bus operators, back and forth. I'm aware of bus operators who will never work again because they had no respirators. Okay. Mr. Grant, Mr. Uh, during the Mr. initial collapse, I did not have a respirator. Following that, my trips down there were. I did have a respirator, and I did do personally give my membership a tremendous amount of them. We spent a tremendous amount of money. My membership on respirators. Did the and union fit bought the respirators? Yes, they did. Not not the state or city government. Uh, and or the, federal government. On the, I'm trying to give you the exact date, 12th or 13th. Those days are a little blurry to me, sir. But that week, my particular union bought thousands of dollars in respirators, respirators, and we bought fit testing, and we brought it to the site, and we got our membership, and we started fit testing our membership. And you saw the necessity for doing that right away. Yeah, I felt it. Okay. In my chest. Mr. Rapp? Yeah, me, all, me also. I, uh, I had a respirator from November to March when I was From working. November? What about September to November? Um, no, I wasn't there. I was a uh, volunteer. So you, I didn't you have used a respirator. the respirator the entire time? Well, it was hard to communicate with your other workers. So you used it part of the time? Yeah. Part of the time. Mr. Nath, <laughs> just one thing. Yeah. I would love for the congressional hearing to try to work, even sitting at a desk, for a 12 hour day with this with respirator, respirator on. I Not walking up and down and not digging in a pit, but just sitting for 12 hours, even two hours. Just try it and see what it's like. Yeah, now, Mr. McArdle, in your testimony, you say that in the, uh, many firefighters were not given the proper respiratory protection devices, even though complaints about this issue had been made for years. The department did not have and still does not have a respiratory protection program as required by federal regulations for air purifying respirators for well over 10 years. This is a violation of CFR 1910.134. To your knowledge, they still do not have those respirators. Yes, and I'd just like to make a clarification also, Mr. Nadler. Uh, when, when you asked uh, the question about respiratory protection, I had respiratory protection when I initially got down there, which was self-contained breathing apparatus, not a full-face APR. Once the air supply ran out, that was it. When I say that the department didn't have respiratory protection, they did not have full-face air purifying They did not respirators. have the adequate proper protection. Dr. Whedon, right. does the department not have the proper uh, protection that is required by law, or does it? 
And if it doesn't, um, what are you doing to change that? So I, I don't know what the law is. Um, I am a clinic physician okay. taking care. I'm sorry, we'll have to ask somebody else. Then. I, 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 I apologize. I thought you were more from higher up in the in the department, or, or differently, laterally in the department. That's why I said laterally. <laughs> That's why I said laterally differently. So, in the but let, let, let me answer yeah. to the extent that I can. Um, the police department has issued um, terrorism bags, which include a respirator, to all um, of its membership. Uh, there is no such equivalent um, currently sanctioned equipment that either goes with the member or on any of the apparatus. For the, the fire only res For the fire department. The only respirator that is currently being used is the full face self-contained breathing I, apparatus. I so in other words, it's fair to say that it, 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 it differs by department and for volunteers and people from other departments that a lot of people didn't have respirators and some did. Um, let me ask the following uh, question. Um, uh, doc Dr. Frieden, um, you state in your testimony that and you talked and you spoke about in, in response to earlier questions that you're concentrating the registry and uh, uh, where the where people are most heavily exposed, that is to say, below Canal Street. What scientific data do you have that Canal Street is the boundary for heavy exposure? That there's any difference between one block south of Canal Street or one block north of Canal Street, or for that matter? in Brooklyn or on the other side of the Hudson River in New Jersey? Is there any scientific basis for the boundary for the, well, in fact, what you did was simply copy the boundary that the, that the EPA made for their so-called cleanup program. Is there any scientific basis for this boundary? Well, first off, I would like to clarify that it is not solely geographic. There are different groups which are eligible. No, no, but residents. In, individuals who are eligible to participate, including yeah, those who worked in rescue or recovery, those who went to school or taught in schools uh, below, uh, in, in Lower Manhattan, those who uh, lived, and even if they weren't lived present or worked there. there. And, but just uh, please answer the questions. I have more questions to go on. Part of this is a geographically limited. What's the scientific basis for that geographic limit? There's a, a question of a decreasing level of exposure. At, at well, my question is, how do you know? given the fact that you haven't done, that nobody has done what the IG recommended, namely uh, concentric circle uh, testing going out in concentric circles from the, from the uh, World Trade Center, how do you know that in fact there is a decreasing exposure as you get further away? And how do you know where it is appropriate to place a boundary? What's the scientific basis for that? We are making the best judgments given the available data of what the highest level of exposure is. We're not saying that those who are a block away from that are not exposed. We're saying that there's a gradient of exposure based on the best available data. Could you furnish us that data? Because everything that I know says that there is wholly inadequate data. Uh, every testimony we've had at other hearings says that there's wholly in Well, let me ask uh, Dr. Levin. Do you believe there's adequate data to, to, to sustain what the commissioner just said? Well, no, we've been advocating all along, really since early city council hearings, that this approach of going from ground zero in radians in all direction, assessing levels of surface contamination in interior surfaces um, ought to have been done. It's a st straightforward approach and still could be done because not all cleanup has occurred. And that's and the and IG's recommendation. That would be the way to characterize the extent and perimeter of the contamination that occurred. But do you believe that the commissioner is accurate or the, w w in effect saying that, 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 that a boundary line at Canal Street or any particular street over there uh, is scientifically based in terms of uh, where the most heavy exposure is? I don't and think not just Canal Street, but East I don't think he too. said that. I think he said on the basis of the best available data, he, I think, didn't speak to the question of whether the available data are truly, truly adequate. I don't think they're adequate to make that determination. I think the characterization by the sort of approach we just were talking about really ought to be done, so and then you can answer the question. So it's not scientifically valid to do that unless we have data that we don't yet have. Generally, like to, we like to proceed from data. Which, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, take the questions now. Just read a part of the briefing paper that we had, and this was replete with this kind of, of information. Various sizes of particular matter floated in the air and blanketed New York City streets. Fires burned under the debris until the middle of December 2001. A mixture of plastic, metals, and other chemicals 
and products burned or decomposed into very fine particles. The content of the plume varied centimeter by centimeter. Some re researchers found one molecule that had never been found in the air before. According to Paul Leoy of the Environmental Occupational uh, Health Science Institute of the University of Medicine in New Jersey, quote, initial exposures were basically a blackout. Exposures uh, people will cumulatively never see in a lifetime. The problem we have now is we don't know the long-term lifetime health consequences. We just don't know. Do any of you disagree with that basic description? Let me um, say to both you, Commissioner, thank you for staying. I know you feel a little anxiety because the uh, council has asked you to be there too. We got you first, and thank you for staying. Uh, and um, Dr. Levin, uh, I think that the environmental protection, excuse me, I think your health registry is hugely important, and I think your screening is hugely important. Uh, I just want to go on the record. I am troubled, however, that of the 200,000 potential people, that only uh, approximately 12,900 have been enroll enrolled and only 6,000 have completed the 30-minute telephone survey. And I am puzzled by this. Uh, we have allocated 10 to $20 million for that. I can't in the lifetime think of how we would spend so much money for that. And I need you to explain it, and that's why I'm happy you stayed. Thanks very much, and thank you for your support of the registry. Uh, the registry began enrollment only eight weeks ago. And so uh, the money was allocated. It was uh, up to the ATSDR, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, to select a contractor. They went through the contracting process. That took a relatively long time. So you haven't spent ten million yet? Oh, no. Okay, no, it's no. It's allocated for it. Th that's correct. That's okay. correct. And as of today, we have more than 10,000 people who have already yeah. completed. So it's really rapidly expanding. It's not that the money is or already spent. The registry just began enrollment eight weeks ago. If we care about the people who are impacted, the 200,000 who may be, one of the most important things that could come from this hearing is having people be aware of it. We need people to register. We need these interviews to take place. We need this data. Uh, tell us, Dr. Herbert, uh, your screening is basically the workers who are working in, in this facility primarily, correct? It, it includes, it's, uh, the people eligible include those rescue and recovery workers and volunteers other than New York City firefighters, state employees, and federal employees. It also includes people who restored essential services, the telephone services, the electrical services, water services, et cetera. It also includes those people involved in cleaning up the buildings immediately adjacent to Ground Zero, and it includes those workers out at the Staten Island landfill who did what they did in the effort. So and they're the groups that were And it's, it's screening, it's diagnosis, it's, it's um, uh, you're providing uh, medical assistance as well. No, uh, no, no funds are available for medical treatment. What we do is identify people who, on the basis of the history, their physical examination findings, their laboratory findings, have illnesses which we feel are related to World Trade Center exposures, and we have a case management function built into this to make sure that they get plugged into care. That's the role of the screening program. Identify those who are ill, and make sure that whether it's on physical grounds or psychological grounds, and make sure they get put into care. We don't have the resources to provide the care, other than some monies from philanthropic sources that enables us to see a, a small number for a relatively short period of time. And that program, which we're grateful it is funded, and now has a three-month waiting list to get in. The um during our Gulf War hearings, of which we had more than I can, can even remember the number, we had a pilot who had ALS. And he could hardly move any, any part of his body. He could only whisper his wife. And sometimes his father had to tell us what he said. The last question we asked him was, knowing what you know, would you still have done what you did? And I think you know the answer. He said he would do it again. He would do it again. I has suspect that all four of you uh, were less concerned about your health and more concerned about meeting a very drastic human need. Mr. McArdle, 
you uh, wisely used a respira respirator. If you had not, do you think you would be uh, feeling some of the health effects of our other three witnesses? Yes. Yes, I absolutely would be feeling some of the same effects. I was fortunate enough to, to have one with me when the event occurred. Thank you. Um, how many days did you work on the in Ground Zero? Uh, approximately 10. I got there right after the, uh, right, I pulled up on the scene right as the first building collapsed. Mr. Willis? Uh, would I, would I go back? Um, I, I had, like I said, I volunteered to be there, but I had a special reason. I lost two family members under there. Okay. Uh, so yeah, of course I would. Uh, you lost two family members. Yes, I did. L let me ask you this. How many days were you at the site? Weeks. Weeks. Mr. Graham? Would I go back? Um, I don't need to ask you that question, okay. gentlemen. I'm, I'm, I'm really I mean, asking you how many days on the site. I was there uh, at least three days a week throughout the whole project. Right. Mr. Rapp? I was there for, for five months. Five months. Five full months. Well, thank you for what you gentlemen have done. Now, there's no question on the part of any panelists that people need to be properly diagnosed, they need to be properly treated, and they need to be properly cared for. Uh, some of that may be a federal responsibility, some of it may be a state responsibility, some of it may be a local responsibility. In any instance, however, it needs to be a process that is seamless uh, and doesn't make you sick just going through the process. And nothing should delay that process from happening. I would like to know, um, as it relates to the long-term health effects exposures, um, what is the best treatment uh, for those suffering from respiratory problems? What's the best treatment? What do we know? Well, there's a standard of care for irritant-induced asthma and sinusitis. It usually involves um, inhaled steroids, um, either nasal steroids or the kind of steroids that asthmatics use. And of course, Mr. Graham here talked about his rescue pump. These are bronchodilators, things that open the airways when they are shut down. And there are another, a number of other anti-inflammatory medications that are taken either by an inhalation or by mouth um, that can be effective. Uh, when sinuses become acutely infected, we, one is on antibiotics. When even a person who has asthma who develops a bronchitis winds up on antibiotics. But the basic standard of care for these conditions she, she is well established. Say, Mr. Mr. Thomas, uh, Freeman, if you need to go, doctor, uh, why don't you leave? Thank we're, you. We're finishing in two minutes. Okay, okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. But th there is a well-established standard of care um, which involves the use of these anti-inflammatory medications. Expensive? Is it expensive? Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, these inhalers are quite expensive. No, but the whole process of dealing with someone with this type of ailment. The evaluation is expensive. The evaluation, the treatment. And the treatment is expensive. Yeah. Des describe to me what expensive means. Well, each one of these inhalers runs between 60 to $80 for a single unit. A person who has active asthma, you know, will go through several of these in the course Dr. of the Dr. Herbert, month. you can answer the questions, oh. too. Well, Actually, some of the inhalers are even more. I mean, but some of I'm them. I'm asking about the whole treatment. Forget just this little uh, element of it. I want to know: Are we talking thousands of dollars a month? Are we talking thousands of dollars a year? The total treatment, the total care. I want to grasp something about the magnitude of the cost. Yes, Dr. White. So, um, they're involved in screening. I'm involved in treatment. Okay. So we're, we're also doing so, treatment. Or, but, but most. Yes. So the, the, their agenda is not treatment of all people who come to them. Yes, sir. My agenda is treatment of all people who come to them. Well, yeah. and, and I can just tell you that on average, I will treat these patients for well over a year. I will see them um, at least once a month, frequently two or three times a month. I will order testing um, that will come up to maybe two to $5,000 for any individual case. And um, I would guess that uh, the respiratory component will cost between two and $400 a month. And in addition, with regard to prevention, one of the surprising things that we found is that these patients also have severe heartburn. And that treating the heartburn, which is also quite expensive, um, then markedly improves the respiratory symptoms that patients have. So 
I think there's an advantage to having all of this done in one place with physicians who see a high volume of these patients, and it allows us to be more efficient. Let me ask you, is there anything that any of you want to put on the record before we go to our next panel? Uh, first, may I just ask, is there any member that just has a question that needs to be put on the record of any member here? If not, uh, anything that any of you would like to put on the record before we go to panel two? Yes, sir. Um, one of the things that has been obliquely mentioned but is not really the, been the focus of the testimony is post-traumatic stress disorder. I am not an expert in this, but it is my assessment that a large proportion of the patients who I treat for respiratory illness have post-traumatic stress disorder, and I believe um, that as many permanent disabilities will occur on this basis as on a respiratory basis, and it has already occurred within the fire department that the number of suicides related to the World Trade Center has far exceeded any other cause of mortality after the initial collapse. Anyone else like to put anything on the record? Yes, Doc. Um, I, I, we, in fact, have treated um, hundreds of, of responders, and one of the concerns I have is that in addition to treating the respiratory conditions and the mental health conditions, our patients are a group who have tremendous psychosocial needs because many of them are disabled. They need social services as well as physician care, and I, I would hope that that would be thought about in any plans for treatment. Yes, yes. Yeah. Dr. Levin. Uh, one question on a, on a long-term basis, uh, based on what, uh, based on what you've seen of uh, respiratory ailments and all the other things that you've seen, would you expect to see a high incidence in, in all these people of long latency diseases that come out 15 years from now, cancers and so forth? We don't know, but there are certain groups among the people that we have screened that we worry about a great deal. That includes those people who are cleaning those buildings day in and day out, disturbing settled dust without respiratory protection, without training. And there were some people who were on that pile, right where the plumes of smoke were coming out, containing high concentrations of carcinogenic agents without respiratory protection who may, in fact, be at significantly increased risk you, for you're cancer. You're talking about people who were cleaning buildings afterward? cleaning buildings after the, the collapse of those towers who were provided with no respiratory protection, no training, who did this disturbance of settled dust day in and day out in enclosed spaces and really may have sustained enough exposure. Are you talking about the people who were cleaning in the EPA cleanup or you're not referring to that? Not necessarily in that specific group. I don't know their levels of protection. Okay. I know that building after building, office building and residential buildings were cleaned by largely immigrant workers and who were provided private with contractors. No, through private contractors. Inside. That's inside and out. Yep. Uh, in, inside and out. And the issue for them may, in fact, be one of concern about cancer down the and road. And OSHA, nobody enforced uh, standards of protection on these workers? Not to my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Any other closing comments from anybody? Yes, uh, Mr. Graham. Uh, with your statement before about OSHA. OSHA did lose their office, and they did mobilize quite quickly with no office, no communications, and no equipment. So I just wanted to put that in back on that. Thank you. Uh, I think Ms. Maloney has a, a, a comment. A, a brief uh, question to Mr. Rapp, Mr. Graham, and Mr. Willis, all of whom are suffering from uh, health problems related to 9-11. I'd, I'd like to know, possibly in writing, since our time may be running out, uh, who is paying your medical bills? Um, how are you managing financially? Did you apply to the Victims Fund, uh, the special fund that is uh, managed by Master uh, Mr. Freiburg? Did they res Feinberg, did they respond to your concerns? And what is the current status of your workman's compensation uh, plan? Are you having trouble or has that been resolved? Let's do this. We will uh, supply you a letter uh, with those questions. You'll make sure our committee has that. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you could respond to it, it would be very helpful. Do you have a general response in, in terms of that question that you would like to respond to before we go? No. Generally, my union is paying. Thank God I'm still working. And uh, you, you say your union is paying? My union, my union benefits. My, my coverage through the union is paying for that. And, uh, but if you terminate because of health reasons, there will be no health right. coverage. I have to work so many hours to earn my benefit hours. So if I don't work, there is no benefit. And, uh, I have applied for victim's compensation, and my workman's comp has been denied, whatever. Yeah, okay, denied. denied. Contested. Contested, at least. Okay, well, we got our work cut out for us, don't we?
Uh, you all, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful panel. I appreciate your patience. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Uh, I, I, I want to. One of the members of the audience uh, asked me if it was possible to enter you know, the written, her written testimony. She couldn't testify. Yes, uh, but, if, uh, if we can have the name of the individual uh, and their address, and we'll submit it into the record, and we'll note for the record who that is. Ms. Heidi Mott. Without objection, that would be submitted into the record. We're going to call our next panel. And our next panel and our final panel, we appreciate their cooperation, their uh, foregoing the uh, privilege as the uh, federal. We'll hold on a second here. See, I think it's amazing. These guys are so sick. They fight for their workers' compensation. They can't get it. Now, that's something we've done. We've done right. We supplied the money. Yeah. They can't access it. Well, I, you know, there's I just, something wrong there. Yeah, I hear you. Our next panel is Mr. Paul Gilman, Assistant Administrator for Research right, and Development, Environmental Protection Agency. Ms. Diane Porter, Deputy Director, National Institute for Occupation Safety and Health, NIOSH, accompanied by Dr. Gregory Wagner, Director of the Division of Respiratory Diseases Studies, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And our third witness is Ms. Pat Clark, Area Office Director for New York, New York, Occupation Safety and Health Administration. Also accompanied by David Williamson, uh, with Ms. Porter uh, is Dr. David Williamson, PhD Agency for Toxic Substance Disease Registry. Okay, we'll, 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 okay. Can you get the signs worked out? Hey, Bobby, could you get the signs worked out directly in front? Let's see, are they all right in here? Move Ms. Porter over us a little bit and get rid of the other one. Is that? Thank you. Larry? Everybody's with him. Does this include this one? Does this include this person? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this one is a viable one. Is that right? You okay, buddy? If our witnesses would stand up, please, and we will swear you in. We all set? Everybody here? Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. And I thank uh, others for standing in case we needed to draw on your expertise. That's very thoughtful. Uh, I'm going to say again, thank you for being the second panel. Thank you for listening to the first panel. Um, we, uh, we know what our task is, uh, and we're going to get to it. Um, we're going to start first uh, with uh, 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 Ms. Porter. We'll go to Dr. Gilman, and then we'll go to, to uh, Ms. Clark. That will be the order of it. And um, uh, Ms. Porter, thank you. Um, wait, let, wait, let's wait till we get a little quiet here a second, a little movement. I'm sorry. So, Ms. 
ways. I think. Yeah, we need the talking in the room to stop, please. Thank you. Welcome. Ms. Porter, you have, a, you have the uh, time. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Representative Maloney, and members of the committee. My name is Diane Porter, and I'm the Deputy Director for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, a part of the Centers for Disease Control within the Department of Health and Human Services. Accompanying, accompanying me here today are Dr. Gregory Wagner, a physician and the Director of NIOSH's Division of Respiratory Disease Studies, and Dr. David Williamson, the Director of the Division of Health Studies with CDC's Agency for Toxic, Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Thank you for this opportunity to appear today to provide testimony on behalf of CDC and ATSDR regarding our ongoing efforts to address the health impacts of the World Trade Center disaster on the rescue, recovery, and response workers, and on the nearby community members who were so directly affected by the events of that day. As you know, CDC provided extensive emergency assistance to workers and residents near Ground Zero in the immediate aftermath of the September 11th attacks. My testimony here today will focus on our subsequent activities to address the health effects of that disaster on the emergency and frontline workers who came to help, and to evaluate the physical and mental health impacts on the wider community of people living, working, and going to school in the vicinity of the World Trade Center site. In the interest of time, I will summarize these activities today, but a more detailed description of our, written, of our efforts is in the <coughs> written statement submitted to the subcommittee. In the weeks following September 11th, NIOSH was in close contact with the medical staff of the Fire Department of New York and with other community-based occupational health providers who began reporting health problems they were finding in workers and volunteers who had been at the site. An informal network of occupational medicine specialists was established with NIOSH's assistance. Let me just interrupt you a second and say, if this panel, given its three, goes over its five minutes, uh, you know, that's, you know, acceptable. We want you to put on the record what you need to put on, so don't, don't feel you have to rush. Thanks. Um, this informal group, led by Mount Sinai School of Medicine's Center for Occupational and Environmental Medicine, discussed their findings and began to better define the type and severity of health problems they had seen. And this activity laid the groundwork for the creation of a comprehensive medical screening program for these workers. In November and December of 2001, NIOSH was contacted by several labor unions and employers representing workers employed in buildings near the World Trade Center site asking us to look into their health. In response, NIOSH performed a series of health hazard evaluations that showed elevated rates of upper and lower respiratory and gastrointestinal system symptoms, as well as symptoms of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder in the World Trade Center area workers compared to similar workers elsewhere. These symptoms were still present two to six months after September 11th. In January of 2002, with funds from FEMA, CDC provided $4.8 million to the New York City Fire Department and $2.4 million to the New York State Department of Health to conduct baseline medical evaluations for New York City firefighters and state employees who responded at the World Trade Center site. Shortly thereafter, also in 2002, Congress gave $12 million to CDC for baseline medical screening of the other emergency service and rescue and recovery personnel who responded to the events of September 11th. CDC awarded a contract to Mount Sinai Center for Occupational Environmental Medicine to establish this program within weeks of receiving the funds. Mount Sinai, in consultation with CDC and other occupational health experts, developed a comprehensive screening program, which beginning in July of 2002, provided a response workers with a baseline medical assessment and assistance with referrals for follow-up care. A consortium of occupational health clinics was created to provide these services to response workers and volunteers throughout the New York City area and in the rest of the country. As of October 2003, the consortium has screened over 7,000 workers. In, in 2003 also, Congress directed that FEMA provide $90 million to CDC for long-term medical monitoring of the World Trade Center rescue and recovery workers and volunteers, including $25 million that was designated to be used for current and retired New York City firefighters. In anticipation of receiving these funds, CDC held a public meeting in New York City in May of 2003 to gather input regarding the content and structure of the long-term screening program. 
there was broad consensus among, among meeting participants that the program should include multiple clinical sites, that the existing short-term screening program was very satisfactory and therefore current providers should continue to provide services, that quality control across the centers is important, and that the content of the program should remain flexible to accommodate evolving needs and treatment. There was also agreement that the baseline screening program should be extended beyond the 9,000 workers who were currently funded. Based on this input, CDC supplemented the existing contract with Mount Sinai within six working days of receiving the funds um, with, a, with $4 million to cover baseline screening e exams to approximately 3,000 additional workers. These examinations will be conducted through March of 2004. The $25 million designated for long-term follow-up for the New York City to Fire Department will be provided to FDNY to conduct a program in coordination with CDC. Just as the baseline screening program is completed, in March of 2004, the remaining dollars will be provided to clinical centers to implement the long-term medical screening program that will provide workers with a choice of providers. The program will also include a centralized coordination center to assure quality control and allow for periodic review of screening. In addition to our activities to address the health needs of rescue response and recovery workers, HHS agencies in collaboration with others are working to identify the health effects of the World Trade Center disaster on the people who were living, working, or going to school in the vicinity of Ground Zero. Details on these studies are outlined in my written testimony. Finally, the subcommittee has expressed specific interest in the World Trade Center Health Registry, which was launched on September 5, 2003 with an extensive outreach campaign. In collaboration with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and with startup funds provided by FEMA, ATSDR has established a registry to identify and track over the long term the health of tens of thousands of workers and community members who were mostly directly exposed to smoke, dust, and debris from the World Trade Center site. To date, more than 10,000 people have been interviewed. It is estimated that the registry will include 100,000 to 200,000 individuals, including rescue and recovery workers, office workers, residents, and school children, making it the largest registry of its kind. The registry will provide a complete picture of the health effects um, resulting from the events of September 11th. It also will serve as a resource for future research studies into the con health consequences of September 11th and a tool for disseminating important health information to the public and to health care providers so that people can make informed decisions about their health care. <coughs> In addition, people interviewed also will, will be provided with referrals to health care providers for health problems they may be currently experiencing. The registry will be maintained over time by the City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. In summary, CDC and ATSDR are committed to assessing the health effects resulting from the September 11, 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center and identifying the physical and mental health needs of affected workers, residents, and community members. Thank you for your attention. I'm pleased to answer Thank you, questions. Mr. Porter. Dr. Gilman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if it's all right, may I uh, show my slides from the podium there? I have uh, yeah, if you, that, fine. And as long as we hear pick you up in the mic, that's fine. Okay. Now, will we see, and we'll see it on this TV screen here, I guess. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, first, if I could just go over uh, uh, the elements of EPA's response to the events of, of September 11th. Um, EPA, uh, in its uh, emergency response capability, uh, activated its, its emergency response team within minutes of the attack uh, and sent on-scene coordinators to begin collecting uh, bulk dust and air samples, uh, both uh, at the site of the World Trade Center and subsequently on the 11th to uh, areas of New Jersey and Brooklyn as well. Uh, in the days following September 11th, we began to establish a fixed air monitoring system, which ultimately uh, consisted of 12 different monitoring, uh, 20, excuse me, 20 different uh, monitoring stations in addition to the network of monitoring stations that are in place uh, for uh, activities such as monitoring for particulate matter under the Clean Air Act. Uh, EPA's uh, principal mission immediately following the collapse was uh, to address the safe collection and disposal of large amounts of 
and quantities of dust and debris. And along with uh, other federal agencies, my colleagues here today, uh, supplying respirators and protective gear to uh, workers uh, and uh, uh, truck operators uh, for ground zero. Uh, EPA has subsequently been asked by the city to uh, initiate its uh, residential cleanup program, which began in May of last year. Uh, and we continue to uh, perform laboratory health effects research on dust and other contaminants uh, from the World Trade Center uh, in our effort to try and better understand the health consequences of, uh, of that day. In that regard, let me speak to you about uh, our draft exposure on human health evaluation, which was released in December of last year. It's currently undergoing peer review in response to that peer review. Um, let me start by saying a few things that, I'll start by saying what the report does address and then what it doesn't address. Uh, the draft report does focus on outside air. It focuses on the general public. Uh, it highlights six particular contaminants that we believed were, were uh, most important uh, to assess. Uh, it also tries to uh, uh, look at what the human exposures to the contaminants were, as, as you know, uh, a contaminant uh, may have a health effect, but just what kind of health effect it has depends on how much an individual is exposed to of that. So we're trying to assess how much individuals were actually exposed to these, to these contaminants. Um, we discussed the potential uh, health impacts of those contaminants and, uh, and, discussed the, the, and utilized the data that was available at that time. The draft report doesn't address indoor air, except incidentally. Uh, it doesn't address uh, first responders at ground zero. Um, it doesn't assess uh, residential or occupational exposures. Um, and it doesn't predict uh, human health effects, uh, nor does it um, uh, purport to examine all of the different contaminants that were found at the, at the site at the time. Now let me... Uh, generally give you the findings of the report, then we can talk a little bit of the specifics of the contaminants in question. Uh, first of all, people exposed to extremely high levels of outdoor pollutants on, on September 11th at the time of the collapse in the vicinity of the World Trade Center uh, are at risk for both acute and potentially long-term or chronic respiratory and other types of, of health impacts. Uh, we, we found that the information available uh, on September 11th and in the days uh, following didn't really allow us to well characterize uh, this particular period uh, of exposure and the potential health effects. Um, except for exposures on September 11th and possibly during the next few days, we did find that uh, the people in the surrounding community were unlikely to have been exposed to contaminants in a way that would result in either short-term or long-term adverse health effects. Now, the status of the report is that it is currently draft, it is going through revisions, and we hope to have it finalized uh, in the spring of 2004. The contaminants we looked at included particulate matter, uh, asbestos, dioxins and PCBs, metals, and volatile organic compounds. Uh, for the particulate matter, uh, in the several days after the attack, uh, monitors were showing uh, high levels of uh, particulate matter that did exceed uh, the EPA's 24-hour air quality index, but by mid-October, those levels had receded to ones uh, historically seen uh, in the city. For asbestos, uh, there were relatively few outside air measurements of asbestos that exceeded EPA or OSHA standards. And I, sh I should comment that for all of these substances, uh, we're hampered to some degree by the fact that we had not uh, in the past expected to have to look at short-term exposures. So the benchmarks we're utilizing in doing this analysis are borrowed from the occupational agencies uh, and other circumstances. Uh, EPA has traditionally focused on, on longer-term chronic exposures. Uh, so for asbestos, uh, the air measurements uh, uh, taken, uh, there were a few exceedances of EPA and OSHA standards. Um, high levels of asbestos were found in dust uh, in two apartments sampled on the 18th and in the uh, 
uh, grab samples that were done in the area of the, of the World Trade Center. Um, the report also does discuss the ATSDR uh, study that was done on, on uh, apartments uh, in, beginning in the November timeframe. Uh, dioxins and PCBs. Uh, there were high measurements in the first month after uh, September 11th, uh, in particular uh, in and around the World Trade Center uh, Ground Zero site. Uh, exposures by inhalation of uh, dioxins in particular uh, were not uh, at a, a level that should cause either uh, acute concerns or long-term concerns. The major, major path for dioxins of concern uh, is really through ingestion, through, through food exposures. For metals, there were some exceedances of uh, EPA benchmarks for lead in the first month, but the way the lead standard is set up, it's, it's for exceedances that uh, extend over a 90-day period, and we didn't see anything like that uh, for the lead uh, at the site or in the, in the area surrounding the site. And lastly, for volatile organic compounds, we did see elevations principally of benzene uh, over the month following uh, the Trade Center, uh, but none of those exceeding benchmark uh, standards. Now let me uh, speak for a moment uh, to our efforts at trying to reconstruct uh, the exposures that people have seen. Uh, what I have here on, on this screen is actually a, a graphic of a reconstruction of the plume for the first several days following uh, the, uh, the collapse of the, of the World Trade Center. Um, it's animated and as you can see uh, through time, uh, the, the, the wind direction did shift. Um, this is the standard sort of a tool we have available to us today. It's based on uh, meteorological information that comes to us from sites like LaGuardia Airport or Kennedy Airport. Um, and currently, the Department of Energy and NOAA are engaged in putting in place systems in a number of cities around the country that are much more fine scaled, if you will, where the meteorological information that's collected is, is uh, much uh, 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 better represented for uh, the areas in question. Um, EPA is currently engaged in collaborating with them, and what we are actually trying to do um, is apply some tools we had begun to develop in Midtown, New York, for trying to better understand how uh, people living in an urban setting are exposed to uh, normal pollutants. Um, what we've done with what is a computer model, a numerical model, um, is now transfer that work to the um, lower end of Manhattan and try and uh, computationally understand how uh, the particles and emissions flowed in the area uh, in and around uh, the World Trade Center. And so I'll, this is a visualization now of that kind of modeling. Uh, the field that's moving through shows you the different uh, directions and velocities of the wind at the different points along uh, the southward movement uh, at the World Trade Center. And we're using this model uh, along with an actual physical scale model that was done for uh, Lower Manhattan at our research facility in Research Triangle Park uh, to work back and forth between uh, the physical model, a wind tunnel model of Lower Manhattan, and that computational model that uh, I described. And this is a, a scene of, of uh, uh, gases, uh, simulated gases being uh, released at the World Trade Center site. The result of moving back and forth between this kind of physical model and a computational model is that we can begin to um, uh, recreate uh, exposures at the time of the collapse and in the few days following that that we cannot do from actual measurements. So what you see here uh, is a recreation of concentrations of no particular pollutant. We've yet to go back and plug in to these, uh, to these, to these models actual uh, emissions data. But what this represents is, and, and let me explain the different so-called ISO lines, lines of common concentration. The yellow circle 
uh, in and around the World Trade Center site represents the highest concentration. Uh, the uh, green line with the number 10 on it would represent a tenfold reduction in the concentration of uh, a contaminant and the blue line a 100-fold reduction in the contaminant. Also marked on, on this map uh, is the area that represented the exclusion zone in the initial phases uh, of the disaster. Um, we've also done this now for, for one other uh, uh, wind direction and we're continuing to expand that. Our hope is using a model like that uh, and also, again, a computational approach to understanding what happened immediately as the World Trade Center collapsed, we'll be able to recreate the exposure levels that people were exposed to. Uh, what, I, what I have here is a, is a computer-generated model. This isn't an animation. This is actually a calculation done of the collapse of, of one of the buildings at the World Trade Center. And it's through this type of modeling that we hope to be able to combine the physical model that I showed you, the numerical model, and begin to better estimate the exposures that uh, people present at the time of the collapse and first responders were, were subjected to. Uh, let me now summarize for you some of the things that the EPA has done since the World Trade Center in an effort to, to improve our response capability. We have updated and revised our national uh, approach to response. Uh, we have expanded our training and in incident response. Uh, we've built a uh, more sophisticated and larger emergency operations center. Uh, we have established both at headquarters and in the regions uh, a support corps, actually backup folks for our, our trained professionals in emergency response. Uh, we've also purchased special communications and monitoring equipment. Uh, that would uh, uh, overcome some of the difficulties we had in establishing a monitoring network uh, in the case of the World Trade Center. We have established another uh, emergency response team, national emergency response team uh, in the West, uh, and we have created a Homeland Security Research Center to develop uh, the kinds of technologies uh, and first responder computer tools that I've been trying to, to show you here today. Um, those rapid risk assessment tools, uh, we believe, can help with pre-planning for first responders. Uh, we've also developed uh, a scientific response team that will be available uh, to, uh, to both first responders and EPA decision makers uh, for future events. Uh, we've also um, been trying to improve those models, as I showed you on air transport. And also, we've upgraded our laboratory uh, capacity to serve as a, as a backup uh, to the uh, Department of Defense when it comes to biologicals and other agents. And I'll stop there, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Gilman, you've given us uh, a lot to think about, and uh, you'll generate a number of questions by your uh, presentation. Thank you. Ms. Clark. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss OSHA's role in protecting workers after the tragic events at the World Trade Center on September 11th. I'm the Regional Administrator for Region 2 OSHA, which covers New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. OSHA's mission is to ensure safe and healthful working conditions for employees in this nation. Within hours of the attack, OSHA joined with other federal, state, and local agencies as well as safety and health professionals from contractors and trade unions on site to help protect workers involved in recovery, demolition, and cleanup operations. Working under perilous conditions, OSHA began coordinated efforts to protect the health and safety of workers. In line with the federal response and national contingency plans, OSHA determined it could be most effective by providing assistance and consultation. It was apparent the site was not a typical construction or demolition project. Workers needed immediate protection from hazards, the scope and severity of which were unpredictable. OSHA's primary responsibilities were to conduct personal air monitoring to characterize exposure, distribute and fit respirators along with other personal protective equipment, and conduct safety monitoring. OSHA committed nearly 1,100 staff, sometimes as many as 75 a day. Our employees remained on the site for 10 months, providing a 24-hour presence, 
seven days a week. Our staff spent more than 120,000 hours on site. We conducted over 24,000 analyses of individual samples to quantify worker exposure. We collected more than 6,500 air and bulk samples to test for asbestos, lead, other heavy metals, silica, other inorganic and organic compounds, totaling 81 different analytes. Personal sampling was conducted around the clock each day and coordinated with safety and prof health professionals on site. OSHA sampling efforts included breathing zone samples of workers on and near the pile. The tasks included search and recovery, heavy equipment operation, steel cutting and burning, manual debris removal, and concrete drilling and cutting. OSHA's breathing zone samples showed exposures that were well below the agency's permissible exposure levels for the majority of chemicals and substances analyzed. To ensure that workers were fully informed about the potential risks, we employed several means to disseminate the information. We distributed sampling summaries to trade unions, site contractors, and agencies during daily safety and health meetings. Personal sampling results, including an OSHA contact number, were mailed directly to workers. Those whose sample results exceeded the Pell were encouraged to seek medical consultation. We also posted these results on our website within eight hours. OSHA consistently recommended workers on the site wear appropriate respirators. The respirators were selected jointly with all the site safety and health professionals. We agreed on a high level of protection. A half mask negative pressure respirator with high efficiency particulate, organic vapor and acid gas cartridges. This was communicated through orders and notices posted throughout the sites. And you'll see a number of exhibits labeled one through eight as well as the poster in the front showing this. OSHA continued to conduct extensive risk assessment to verify the selected respirators remained appropriate. When sample results for jackhammering and concrete drilling operations indicated a higher level of protection was needed, a full face piece respirator was required for those operations. Shortly after the attack, OSHA became the lead agency for respirator distribution, fitting, and training. At the peak of the operation, basically the first three weeks, we gave out 4,000 respirators a day. We distributed more than 131,000 during the 10-month recovery period. Would you beat that number again? How many? 131,000 in the 10 months. Distribution to workers did pose challenges. OSHA initially deployed staff by foot with bags of respirators. We followed this up by mobile teams on all-terrain vehicles, as you'll see in Exhibit 9. We also established a distribution point at the Queens Marina, which was the Fire Department of New York's staging point. We opened multiple equipment distribution locations throughout the 16-acre site. You'll see two of those in Exhibits 10 and 11. OSHA conducted over 7,500 quantitative fit tests for negative pressure respirators, including nearly 3,000 for FDNY personnel specifically. You refer to Exhibit 12 for that. Fit testing included instruction on storage, maintenance, the proper use, and the limitations of respirators. 45,000 pieces of other protective equipment were given out as well, such as hard hats, glasses, and gloves. We're also proud that despite this highly dangerous rescue and recovery mission, there was not one fatality. More than 3.7 million work hours were expended during the cleanup operations with only 57 non-life-threatening injuries. This is really remarkable given the nature and the complexity of the site. The key to success was working in partnership. A joint labor management safety and health committee was established to identify hazards and recommend corrective actions. An unusually high level of safety and health oversight, training, and direct involvement of workers resulted. Union stewards met weekly with us and with the other agencies and their, their employees. They distributed safety bulletins directly to their workers and they held toolbox talks. 
OSHA and the Center to Protect Workers' Rights of the AFL-CIO collaborated to provide mandatory safety and health training for all the workers on the project. We learned a great deal at the WTC site, lessons that can help the agency and the nation improve emergency preparedness. Employers must regularly review and practice evacuations. It's also essential to establish channels of communication prior to an emergency. Nationwide, OSHA is reaching out to the entire emergency response community and coordinating this with the Department of Homeland Security. One of the goals in this is to ensure that first responders wear properly fitted and maintained respirators at work sites that may have toxic releases. The agency is also working in partnership with the CPWR to provide skilled support personnel with the training to ensure that America has a workforce that's prepared to safely respond to national emergencies. Mr. Chairman, in addition to my concern for workers at the WTC site, I have personal interest in the short and long-term effects of exposures because my staff and I spent so much time there, 10 months. Our Manhattan area office was destroyed when the North Tower of the WTC collapsed on our building. During evacuation, our employees were exposed to all of the same potential contaminants in the atmosphere as others who were in lower Manhattan that day. I can say with confidence and pride that OSHA staff did everything humanly possible to protect the workers during our recovery efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Before um, recognizing Ms., uh, Mrs. Maloney, I, I want to say that um, this has been important testimony, and there'll be some tough questions to follow. But uh, I wish some of this information had come out sooner. Um, and I will say to you, Ms. Clark, uh, I, I think uh, our previous panel, some of the witnesses, wanted to make sure that, uh, uh, that your work uh, of, of your, your agency was recognized, because you were in the thick of it. Um, and I'm also going to say that in the first day or two, we probably needed the respirators more than, than later. But uh, I know the mentality of everyone there. They just wanted to do whatever was necessary to get the job done. And I hope we don't forget uh, what motivated people in those first few days. Um, it wasn't about their own safety. It was just see if we can find anyone who's still alive. Uh, and we, uh, we know that. Um, and I'm also going to say uh, that we're all Americans here. We're all, uh, we love our country and we love the people who serve it and we love the people who were involved in this effort. And uh, we're going to just, you know, go forward and, uh, and look backward and go forward. And um, so with that, I'm going to first recognize Ms. Maloney. I'm going to then go to uh, Mr. Turner, then to um, to uh, Mr. Owens and then to Mr. Nadler. We might have a second round if it's deemed necessary or partly that. Uh, and um, so, uh, Ms. Maloney, you have the floor for 10 minutes. I'm not gonna let you ask a question in the 10th minute that takes them five minutes to then respond to. I'm gonna keep you to the 10. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I thank all of the panelists for your testimony and, and your hard work. Um, if you were here earlier, I asked a question of the first panel. I asked them if they thought the federal government was doing all that they should or could do uh, to respond to 9-11, and every, everyone raised their hand saying that they did not believe that enough had been done, and then they said what they thought should be done. I, I would like to ask you the same question. Um, and to respond with what you think Congress should be doing or the government should be doing uh, to respond, respond to the disaster of 9-11. And be very short and go right down the line, starting uh, with Ms. Porter and going straight down, or Dr. Williamson. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think related to the um, health issues of workers that um, it's critically important that the screening program which is underway be continued and be funded for the long term. I think that in addition um, funds for treatment um, would be appropriate as would funds for research mm -hmm. studies that could be done. Um, uh, lastly I think that uh, having listened to the first panel it's really important that we sort out um, the workers compensation issues. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wagner? 
up in uh, our particular arena. I think uh, the efforts at getting our emergency response teams pre-positioned, trained, and properly equipped are underway. We need to complete that. Um, we continue to support research, uh, both in the uh, in the in the short run, uh, for better understanding uh, what what took place in terms of human health uh, at the World Trade Center, and more broadly uh, mm -hmm. for other potential terrorist attacks for the future. Ms. Clark. I, I think it's essential that we not lose focus about what happened here, and that we not forget, and we we do not plan. Planning is absolutely essential. Emergency preparedness is all about using the things that we learned here, what went right, what went wrong, and try to work on those. I think working with the respirator community on having respirators that are um, more likely going to be worn mm -hmm. by workers is very important. Mm -hmm. Working mm -hmm. with the responders to make sure that they are comfortable with respiratory mm -hmm. protection. Prior to 9-11, they really were only accustomed to the self-contained breathing apparatus, the scuba-like tanks. They didn't know what negative uh, uh, respirator, or pressure respirators were, and that was a problem. And we are working very hard with those groups. Coordination, collaboration, and let's not forget that we have to keep working on this issue. I think that's absolutely essential. We can all do more in that regard. Uh, Ms. Ms. Porter, if you heard the, the first panel, I'd, I'd like to place into the record a series of questions uh, really on the funding. Um, the funding for the monitoring was a bipartisan effort uh, along with uh, uh, Senator Clinton and, and Senator Schumer and others and uh, Mr. Shays and, and Mr. Turner all supported it. Yet what we heard from the first panel is they're not getting the money. Uh, that the, the fire department says they're not getting the 25 million to continue their monitoring and treatment and that uh, Mount Sinai does not know if there will be a disruption in their screening uh, program. They have people on the waiting list uh, uh, trying to get in to be screened. And I'm sure you heard the comments that they felt the central registry uh, both in Mount Sinai and the city was more effective in compiling the data for future research. I understand you have plans to market it out to different areas around the city or whatever, and, and this might be problematic. And uh, my overall question is, uh, what is the, wh why, why can't they get the funding? We voted this months ago. Uh, this was a bipartisan effort. It was signed into law, and they're still telling us that they don't have the money. Okay. Um, the funds were transferred to us from FEMA um, on June 17th, mm -hmm. and six days subsequent to that, we provided funding to the Mount Sinai mm -hmm. Clinic to extend the baseline screening work, which was what um, was deemed appropriate after the May 2nd meeting that we had, um, which we had, by the but way. But the continued funding, the 25 right. million and the continued and, um, 90 million. And mm -hmm. then um, on 10 days subsequent to receiving the funds, um, we provided, we signed a contract with the New York City Fire Department. And unfortunately, um, we have, in working together with the Fire Department, um, learned that we want to encourage firefighters to participate in the program, ensure the quality of the data, as well as the consistency of the data with the other screening programs so that its utility over time is, um, is there. And unfortunately, we um, determined that the contracting mechanism was not the appropriate mechanism to use. Even though it got the money out there quickly, it did not, um, it, it meant that the government had to have the data um, in other words, the data was transferred to us. Um, the fire department was <coughs> concerned about that issue related to confidentiality. Well, well I would uh, like to um, work with you in a further meeting on how we can get these funds released right. and out of Washington right. and into where they were designated. Right. Uh, doc, Dr. Gilman, uh, uh, I, I'd like to, as I mentioned, uh, this, there was an article today in uh, the Daily News uh, where they talk about a memo that came out uh, directly after 9-11 saying that uh, it was a health uh, crisis that was uh, detrimental to, to the health of people, that they should not return to the area, should not be the, in the area. And uh, I don't know if you've read the article, but it's uh, a scientific um, Juan, Gonzalez uh, Juan Gonzalez column, and, but a scientific uh, uh, expose, basically, saying that, 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 that there was not a response. Just in walking outside for a moment, several um, people came up to me, including one reporter, who said they were at ground zero. The catastrophe happened on 
Tuesday, but it was not until Saturday before any monitoring notice was put up saying that, it, that the air could be uh, problematic, that there was no monitoring notices put up until Saturday. Uh, you said in your, in your testimony that you responded uh, immediately, yet they're telling me that nothing was put out publicly to them until Saturday. And according to Juan Gonzalez's article, the scientific um, analysis that was done was not responded to. And I, because he's going to cut me off, I know, I just want to, uh, say that at this, this uh, map that you showed of the plume going out and where it was the most uh, problematic, I, I quite frankly was surprised to see that the area that was the most infected really was in Brooklyn in the plume that went out uh, from the, from the uh, study. And so I'd, li I'd like to know, um, do you have any data, Ms. Porter or, or others, on the emergency rooms that uh, responded on 9-11 particularly from Brooklyn hospitals after 9-11. According to that plume, there should have been uh, more uh, medical problems in Brooklyn, and I've been told through hearsay from medical doctors that there were huge increases in admissions for adult uh, asthma and, and general respiratory problems uh, after 9-11 in, uh, in Brooklyn as much as 23%. I don't know if there's any, any historical data on that, but if you could get back in writing to me on it if we don't have the time. But Dr. Gilman, what they're telling me out there, including reporters, they're saying, I was down at ground zero. There was nothing put up telling us that there was a health problem from EPA until Saturday, clearly many days after the disaster. Well, let me start by saying. Um, Can't hear you, sir. Well, it's the mic. It's not his fault. I, I, let me start by saying uh, your interpretation of the graph is, is incorrect. Uh, the first two photos uh, appended to the testimony actually show the greatest concentrations in, in the immediate vicinity of uh, the World Trade Center, uh, not, not Brooklyn, in fact. But um, this one, the impacts after days, is that not Brooklyn? I mean, I, this is the, this, this, plume this graph, study, yes. the plume study, that's and, Brooklyn. And that's, that's, that is the, uh, not, not the dust uh, mm -hmm. plume, but that would be the the plume from fires, and the different concentrations are color-coded there, uh, mm -hmm. with the greatest concentration being in, in close uh, in, the, in the red area. And mm -hmm. there is no question that in, in the first uh, hours and probably all the way through to the second day, uh, there, were, there were debris from the World Trade Center found uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, as the representative of the, of the New York Department of Health was saying, the question was, where, was, where were the concentrations the greatest? Where was the greatest concern um, for exposures to people? Uh, mm -hmm. As far as, as information available to folks at, at ground zero, uh, the EPA and other federal agencies were getting together within 24 hours of the event and trying to sort out. But they're saying no notices were put up. We have an example well, of a notice I here for know, safety, but nothing was put up from EPA saying uh, that this is a dangerous zone, uh, watch out for your health, that there was no air monitoring reports to the public until Saturday. Well, That's the, what they're that, telling me. The two different things, the public at large okay. and, and uh, the, the people located at Ground Zero and at the, at the site of the collapse of the World Trade Center. Uh, EPA professionals as well as other agencies were telling people at the site that it was a, that it was a dangerous place uh, in terms of what was, what was being uh, breathed. And so the advice throughout was, as, as offered by OSHA and others, was to use respirators. Mm -hmm. um, the question of what was being said to the public uh, you know, that's, I, I can't speak uh, to uh, the, the availability of flyers or not, um, but I can speak to the, to the fact that there were oral communications with, with, the, with the city, uh, with the workers, uh, on the part of, I think, all of our agencies about the danger at, at Ground Zero. Thank you. We're My time is up. Thank you. And, and we'll, we'll be able to ask a few more questions here, so it's not your last chance here. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. Turner. When we, as a nation, watch the tragedy of the uh, World Trade Center collapsing, I don't think there's an individual who witnessed that, either on, on television or here in this community, who did not intuitively understand 
that there were health impacts and that there were health concerns as a result of those towers collapsing. Um, it doesn't take an, an EPA report or an OSHA report for all of us around the country uh, immediately to have understood the, the health struggles of those who were both responding and who were fleeing uh, the tragedy. Um, we saw them all on television. We read them in our newspapers. And, and scientific uh, analysis wasn't really needed for us to initially understand that the people who were responding were doing so as true heroes and in peril of their, their own safety. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Gilman, I have some questions concerning the EPA's jurisdiction. Um, there's been some questions concerning the EPA's actions uh, during this time period. And um, the, uh, I'm assuming that there is a, a regional air pollution control agency uh, in this area other than just the federal EPA or other air control agencies or monitoring agencies present in, in the New York area, are there not? The way the Clean Air Act works is it's, it really is a partnership. You know I'm, going to ask, I'm going to ask you to use one mic, and we'll, we'll just have one mic directly in front of you. Um, yeah, why don't you move, I'm going to swatch each mic, let's move that one down, and move yours down too, and take this middle one if you will. Can you take this mic there? Sure. It, it really is a, a partnership under the Clean Air Act with, with state government and the federal government. And so, for example, some of the monitors I mentioned that were used that were already in place for purposes of the Clean Air Act are ones that, that aren't operated by the federal government. So, th so this information was readily available to the state agencies and perhaps even the local agencies, not just merely handled or controlled under uh, EPA? Um, yes. Uh, and we did create a website quickly. Uh, it was actually up and functioning by about, I believe it was September 26th, to provide uh, general access to the public uh, for, for the information as well. In, in your testimony and on the, the slides you gave us, it said that um, you mentioned the nationwide air monitors that were already in place that were state, that, that you were coordinating with, uh, with the EPA. Then you go on to say, that the EPA established 20 World Trade Center air sampling stations. Now, I'm assuming that that information was not solely in, uh, in the um, control of the EPA when these stations would report. Uh, who else would have had the information that was coming from these stations? Well, there, there was a, a, a task force put together of state, city, and federal agencies that were trying, all trying to share that information. A database was created. Um, <coughs> I don't know the exact date at which it was up and running for sharing among uh, the different agencies, uh, but as I say, the publicly available site was up by September 26th. Maybe Kathy Callahan of Region 2's office can. My, my basic point, though, in, in asking about who had access to this information is that there's been some perception that somehow the EPA or uh, others might have controlled the spin of the dissemination of this information, and it's, it's my belief that this information would have been much more widely available to state, local agencies, so that it would not have been able to be controlled sure. by the EPA or others in its dissemination or spin, if you will. Ma'am, why don't you go to the yeah. Why don't we have Kathy Callahan, who was in charge of this effort for our Regional 2 office. Uh, you know, just, just, just take, give that mic back. You got your own mic, and I'm going to have you. Uh, and I hope my time will be extended while we exchange mics. No, no, hey, we don't need more mics. We're, we're, we're all set. Everybody has a mic. I'm losing control. I'd like you to uh, tell me your name, your title, and then answer the question. I'm Kathleen Callahan. I'm from EPA's Region 2 office, and I'm the Assistant Administrator for Response and Recovery in New York City Operations. And, and to, yes. to answer the question of who had access to what information, on September 12th, we established, and, and it began the afternoon of the 11th, but we began our first uh, of many, many conference calls with agency representatives from the federal government, from state government, from city government, initially actually from the private sector as well because they were taking samples. And we exchanged sample results among that group and in addition to you know, and, and consulted on what to do next and what the implications of those samples were. In addition to that, every day the Emergency Operations Committee that was established uptown 
uh, which was had representatives from broad base of federal agencies, state agencies, city agencies, had morning meetings w at which you know data results were provided, evening meetings to see if there was anything new to add, and downtown there was a daily meeting at which. Uh, sample response uh, results were provided and um, health and safety issues were also so, addressed so the, every day. So the analysis of this information, the dissemination of it, the reporting of it to the community was not solely controlled by one point or one agency? Absolutely not. Um, Mr. Gilman, I, in looking at the information that you had, Dr. Gilman, excuse me, if you look at the information that you have concerning M EPA's indoor air monitoring and cleaning program, well, one of the, the misconceptions that I heard during panel one was that the EPA had a mandated responsibility to clean up all of the buildings and the apartments that were around the World Trade Center. And when I read your testimony, it talks about a request that you received from New York City and your response and a voluntary um, program where you went to uh, individuals that were in the area and provided some services. And there may be some criticism or question as to the effectiveness of your program. But I just want to touch on the point of whether or not you were legally mandated to clean up um, the uh, results of the World Trade Center collapse. I'll, I'll defer to Kathy in a moment, but I, but I will say that under an emergency response and under the emergency response plan, uh, different responsibilities get divided up among the different agencies. In the, in the case of the indoor air, the initial responsibility went to the City of New York. Uh, subsequently, the City uh, asked the EPA to become more involved and ultimately to, to uh, take over the testing and cleanup program uh, that, was, that was begun in, in May of 2002. Kathy, do you want to add? Um, at, at, that's absolutely accurate, and I think that um, in addition to that, the underpinning of, of our sort of statutory authorizations is important. The Stafford Act is what defines sort of the agency's funding and, and statutory um, opportunities to respond to a federally declared disaster, and so EPA was operating under the Stafford Act. In addition, EPA operates under the um, uh, Superfund law and the National Contingency Plan portions um, regulations that support that law in supporting its role within the Federal Response Plan and in support of the Stafford Act. Okay. Could, you, could you expand your, your answer related to, to testing, but, but specifically with the area of cleanup? I mean, it's the same. Your testimony was that both testing and cleanup uh, concerning the, the program was not something that EPA was mandated to do. Uh, internally in individual dwelling spaces. Is, is that correct? The National C Contingency Plan and, and the Superfund law, which is part of what we're responding under, authorizes EPA to undertake certain actions. But there are a lot of criteria that are applied in exercising the judgment so that we determine when we make, when we proceed on that authorization. And in a federally declared disaster, we do that in the context of a federal response plan and the Stafford Act as well. And so it's not per se a directive to, uh, to conduct certain activities. It's an authorization to conduct them given, you know, the agency's evaluation of the appro appropriateness in the response. Ms. Porter, uh, when you talked about the, um uh, the different baseline medical screening and the databases that were being created. But we have a the split that's happening between the New York um, Fire Department's um, baseline screening, the uh, what Mount Sinai is doing for those individuals who responded to the site, worked on the site, but were not necessarily members of the fire department. And then we also have um, what the health department is doing with individuals that live with, within the area. How, what is your assessment of the coordination of those programs? And what, what advice might you have in that area? Um, currently, there's um, a steering group um, where, as you heard them testify, all, all um, Mount Sinai sits on the fire department steering council, as does the fire department sit on Mount Sinai's um, uh, group. And so there is coordination. Um, could there be better coordination always? And um, I think that as we construct the longer term program, we will actually um, mandate in the announcement um, a steering group that will be constituted and funded through that mechanism. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair would recognize uh, Major Owens. Dr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to begin by 
getting some clarification from Ms. Clark, uh, since they distributed the largest number of respirators, can you clarify the terminology? Uh, there were some workers who said they never had anything for the first uh, few weeks, but paper mask, is that a respirator, a kind of respirator? You mentioned half mask, full mask, and uh, 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 do two categories. Are there other categories, and what do people mistakenly call something else a respirator? I can talk about what we provided, and we did this under the auspices of the New York City Department of Health. They, um, we offered that we would take over the respirator distribution and and fit checking and and fit testing eventually process for them, and we and we did so prior to that. The New York State uh, Department of Labor Public Employee Safety and Health Program, as early as the 12th, were involved with handing out respirators. Um, I mentioned that as a group, all the safety and health professionals on the site got together very early on, after the first couple days, and, and determined that because the site was so unpredictable and we weren't able to determine exactly what the exposures to the workers might be, we would go to a high level of protection. And that was the half face piece negative pressure respirator with the three types of cartridges. The high level particulate uh, respirator or cartridge that would be a filter that would be appropriate for things like asbestos or, or silica or other particulates. Um, an organic vapor that would be for things that might be coming out of the fires, the plumes, and acid gases that also might, might be in that context. Those are the three uh, major categories. So this sort is of the one, one mask you're talking about with three different internal components. It has it can uh, be adjusted. three large, um, it has a, a very large canister. In fact, in the uh, your exhibits, and I think it's, it's exhibit uh, seven or eight, you'll see two of my compliance officers who are on site wearing the, the re respirator with that cartridge on. Um, uh, with the triple cartridges. That's what we felt was appropriate and we continued to do so until we found some of the higher levels in particular operations and then we said not just a half face respirator but one that's full face for people who were doing jackhammering or some of the core drilling operations. You need a higher level of protection that's afforded by that kind of respirator. Those were the kinds of respirators that were provided us through the city of New York. They got contributions from all over the country. Our assistant secretary called uh, equipment manufacturers of respirators that early that uh, first week asking for donations. Those were all provided. The city bought a lot of respirators. In addition, contractors and unions also pr brought respirators to the site. Uh, very early on, though, uh, the site safety and health plan mandated, as you can see by the, the, the signs and in some of the exhibits, that type of respiratory protection, that high level. And that's what, <clears throat> the, what we were involved with. Are using. you familiar with the mask that members of Congress have been given? Uh, all our offices have a certain supply of, of masks. I think they're called gas masks. Uh, I don't, uh, maybe that's. Uh, a popular term. Uh, uh, are they the same as respirators? Are you familiar with the model that, that uh, has been distributed mask, to members a, of Congress? A, some people do use the term gas mask to refer to a type of respirator. I am not familiar p specifically with the ones that that you may have in your offices. No, I, I'm not. Yeah, but I'd be happy I, to work with you if you'd like to have a separate <laughs> consultation on that. Uh, before I go any further, I just want to congratulate OSHA for the magnificent job they did. You were as much a victim in many cases. Uh, your whole agency wiped out, uh, as uh, other people were. Your heroism is to be uh, certainly, uh, you'll be congratulated for that. And, but I hope your experience uh, can be used for the future. And one of the items that you anticipated where I was going uh, is, is, is there a problem with the supply of respirators in the country, manufacturers? Is there a problem with the technology of respirators when they're so clumsy that people don't want to wear them, they don't feel they can work in them and wear them. Uh, are we on top of a, a respirator crisis? Uh, that uh, Was there a respirator crisis? The city certainly didn't have enough. You said they had to get them from various sources. The federal government didn't have any, otherwise you wouldn't have to turn to the city. I mean, you had no, no procedure for a large number of masks that you could reach and pull into the situation right away. 
There actually was a, a, a large number, a, a, a cache of respiratory protection in the, in the city itself. We did lose our own office, our Manhattan area office, so all of our people were without. I'm very fortunate that my regional office is a mile and a half north of the city. We did have some respirators there. We you also keep have respirators stored in your office. Yes, yes, and and we we had enough for the the federal community. We also certainly consider your your concern about a lessons learned issue on respirators. This has clearly been one of the major issues that has come up, and we're working on in that that in a number of ways. Under the Department of Homeland Security, we are working with them to establish caches of equipment around the country, including respiratory and other protective equipment, goggles. The, the dust on the site was also very intense, and that was appropriate to have, have eye protection as well. And so these caches will have that kind of equipment. They'll be located throughout the country. <clears throat> we are also working with the equipment manufacturers, the respirators especially, to determine what their turnaround time is to put more respirators out if we need them and where can we get them and how can we get them to the site. If the, if the issue is in Lower Manhattan, how can we get them there very quickly? The uh, National Guard and all of the other groups that were very helpful in our supply route was very essential at that. But we are, that's part of our preparedness that I talked about before. It is so recognized essential. that we need a system for dealing with supplies of respirators. And Absolutely. That system is in process at this point. Yes. It's being developed. Yes. Uh, one other question. Uh, at least one person mentioned, they use a the phrase that OSHA was not in an enforcement mode. Uh, what's the significance of that? You mentioned partnership model and uh, on my committee, which is responsible for workforce, workforce protection, I'm constantly being assailed by the majority party about the need for partnership models. Uh, I generally uh, agree that it's a good approach, but did that have anything to do with limiting the liability of anybody in terms of uh, the city or the state? Uh, uh, did that, does that have any impact on the callous way in which people who did get ill and have been affected are being treated. Uh, uh, did that remove any obligations? Uh? Absolutely not. As I uh, did try to explain before, we were working within the, the same guidelines of the Federal Response Plan and the National Contingency Plan, which provide for us to do consultation and assistance in some kind of catastrophic event such as this. We quickly determined that this wasn't a typical construction site. It wasn't any kind of normal situation where enforcement would work. The enforcement process is a very legal process that can take up months to years to occur. That was what, not what was needed. What was needed was to have safety and health professionals, OSHA on site, the eyes and, and, and on that site finding hazards getting them corrected immediately. That's why I had so many people there for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 10 months, working with all of these other safety and health professionals. And as someone had, has already mentioned, it did work. We didn't lose a, another life on that site during that time. And, and um, I think that uh, certainly the, the issue of having people there, their presence, We've, we had workers tell us you know, these respirators are tough, but when I see one of your people, I remember to put it back on. I might take it off to talk to someone, or I might not put it on after the mm -hmm. break, but your guy reminded me. I mean, I had people yeah, it's miraculous there that telling me. No lives them. were really lost there, and uh, the whole atmosphere obviously was uh, conducive to getting the job done with minimum uh, risk. Just uh, the last question is, can anybody who's brought into court by some of the sick workers who are looking for relief, uh, use your whole harmless approach as a, an argument, uh, find that your whole harmless approach is being used as an argument against their being able to get compensation for their disability. Or by not in using our enforcement tool, that only meant that we did not issue citations to the contractors. Those were the people who would have received the, any kind of citations. That is the only issue. And there would have been The contractor one cannot say in court that you, you gave them carte blanche to 
No, they operate certainly a certain can't. way, therefore they cannot be held liable? No, they certainly cannot because under the partnership agreement that you, you mentioned earlier, we had a very strong commitment that this type of respirator protection was part of that partnership agreement. Every contractor on the sites, the, the four major contractors on the site signed it, the union signed it, the city agencies that were directing it, the FDNY and, and the uh, uh, Department of Design and Construction, we all signed that. We were all committed to this very uh, comprehensive safety and health program that went far beyond what our regulations would require as far as the respiratory protection, the safety measures, the training. So, no, I, th I think they actually were under a higher level of, of uh, requirement, actually. And you don't cover the Transit Authority and the uh, city and state? That's correct. We have whole the, the private sector and federal employees. We, in New York State, the New York State Department of Labor Public Safety Employee and Health Program covers the state and municipal workers. We're, we're gonna, Thank you. We'll, we'll be able to come back. Thank second. you, Mr. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. No, these are excellent questions, and I'm learning a lot from both the questions and, uh, and from obviously from our witnesses. In the nine years I've chaired this committee, the only person I never swore in was Senator Byrd because I chickened out. Uh, I do want to make sure, I think, uh, Ms. Callahan, you were sworn and you stood up behind and, yeah, so we'll just know for the record you are sworn in as well. I didn't want to add you to my list with it. <laughs> it would have been in high company there. Um, at this time, the chair recognizes uh, the gentleman whose district uh, is obviously <coughs> directly impacted, though so many were. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Turner asked, <clears throat> asked a number of questions or made some statements a few minutes ago which I think go to the heart of some of the questions here. He said that the EPA does not, does not <clears throat> excuse me, does not have a mandate to, uh, to clean up these buildings. Uh, Dr. Gilman, uh, Ms. Callahan said the same or answered the questions to that extent. And Ms. Gilman referred to the Stafford Act. Now, my impression, and let me be very careful on this, that under the, it's not my impression, my knowledge, is that under Presidential Decision Directive Number 62, signed by President Clinton in 1998, the EPA is mandated to clean up any buildings contaminated in a terrorist attack. Administrator Whitman testified to this effect before the Senate in November of 2001. Acting Administrator Harinko testified in a recent deposition under oath that PDD 62 applies to the World Trade Center case and to the cleanup of building interiors. Under President Bush's National Strategy for Homeland Security issued in July 2002, after the World Trade Center, admittedly, the EPA is, quote, responsible for decontamination of buildings and affected neighborhoods, unquote, following a major incident. Would you like to withdraw what you said a few minutes ago or reconfirm it under oath? What, what I said was the exercise of our authority under the Stafford Act and under the National Contingency Plan, and I believe it is consistent with the Presidential Decision Directives, was a decision process. And we made those decisions as to what was appropriate, and we feel we made <coughs> well, them reasonably. Let me ask you this question then. Is it or is it not the duty of, of EPA under Presidential Decision Directive 62 and I would say un also under the CERCLA law, but more importantly under PDD 62, to see to it, perhaps by delegating it to the city or to somebody else, but making sure it gets done one way or the other. It's your responsibility to see to it that indoors as well as outdoors is cleaned up from uh, hazardous waste discharges as a result of a terrorist attack. Yes or no? Uh, Kathy is not the attorney so you for the agency, then. and I'm not an attorney either. Sure. We've been pursuing this question for almost two years yeah, now. Yeah, and I would be, I, I can, I'm not an attorney for the agency either, and, and, I, and you may be a trained attorney, and, uh, and I'm happy to try and, and get some response to your question. I'm not qualified uh, to answer it. Well, I'm not sure that Kathy is. Let me, let me say, you have. Both of you sat here and said essentially it was a city's job, they did it, 
well, they didn't do it, but it was the city's responsibility, and they asked you for help. At other times, people from EPA have testified that the city asked you not to help. And we have been maintaining for two years that it's EPA's responsibility to do it or to delegate it to someone, but make sure it gets done under their supervision. And essentially, you've been saying it's not your, that's not your responsibility. We've been saying, and again, Acting Administrator Harinko testified in his deposition a few months ago that it was. The agency should be able to say it is or it isn't your responsibility. At, at, uh, Congressman, at this time, as, as, I, as I did say, we have taken on that responsibility. No, you have not. Uh, well, I want to know, is it or is it not your responsibility to do it? And you really have, whether you've taken it on or not is a separate question. I would say you have not, and that's a, I won't get into that now. I would, if you, if you don't want to answer on, under oath, et cetera, without getting a lawyer, fine. But I'd ask that you supply an answer to that question afterwards. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. I, I would like to say that these are very fair questions, but I, under no circumstance do I think that our, our witnesses are doing anything but just trying to provide uh, very honest and very candid responses. Um, uh, but I also want to say to the gentleman that I know this has been a, a, a gigantic and legitimate concern and answers haven't been forthcoming and uh, it's important those answers happen. Um, we didn't ask the legal side of EPA to be here to, to, to even deal with that issue, frankly. I um, raised it because Mr. Turner no, did. No, right. Let, 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 a, let a supply right, right, and, 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 and then there will be, and also I just want to assure the gentleman he'll be given more time. I did interrupt. Thank but, you. Yeah. Let me uh, switch. Uh, let me just also uh, uh, just make one comment and then go into some questions. Mr. Turner said that uh, uh, quite logically that it was common sense if you smelled the thing and went there that people knew that there was something wrong with the air. Problem is that starting two days after the disaster in the person of Ms. Whitman and others, the EPA started assuring everybody, don't worry, the air is safe to breathe. There may have been reasons for that. Those assurances were done. I won't get, want to go, I won't get into the IG report, but there were, amp, there were a lot of assurances and at the very least mixed messages. Now let me ask you, uh, uh, Mr., uh, Dr. Gilman, um, in the cleanup that the EPA began in May of 2002, despite demands from my office, the workers who were cleaning up asbestos-laden material when the testing revealed asbestos did not wear any protective equipment. Why? Um, I'm, not, I'm not personally familiar with that cleanup Ms. program. Uh, Perhaps Ms. Callahan. Can't, can't. Based upon the data that was collected in the cleanup of the immediate surroundings of the World Trade Center, OSHA provided us with a um, negative exposure assessment that permitted workers not to wear personal protective equipment in the cleanups that were being conducted but, but, but under. You, but you did testing, and if you. Uh, Okay. under scope A, which was where there was very minimal dust in, in the apartment. In the scope B cleanups that we characterized where there might be substantial dust still there, they would indeed comply with we wearing personal protective equipment. So we well, worked in, in conjunction well, with me, OSHA me, on that issue. Let me say first that the Secretary Henshaw's letter says that wherever there's any dust, you must wear where there's any asbestos, you must wear protective equipment, number one. Number two, I would hope that uh, OSHA can supply us with a copy of that letter saying that they don't have to wear protective equipment in scope A uh, cleanups. And then I'd like to square it with Secretary Henshaw's uh, uh, prior letter of January 2002. And third, it's my information uh, from uh, talking to dozens of people uh, who uh, constituents we never observed a worker ever wearing protective equipment in a scope A or scope E cleanup. So I don't know what evidence you can produce at this point that they did, but um, 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 also, would you define minimal dust for this purpose? A, a light coating of dust. A light dust. coating with a 1% asbestos in it, perhaps? We did not test for asbestos so, so content. With, we with made an assumption, excuse me if I could finish, yeah. Congressman, I think it's important to your point. We made an assumption that all the dust had the potential for asbestos. 
from, from early on. And so, you know, we felt we were being consistent and the negative exposure assessment was based on the, the personal monitoring of workers that worked in heavily, heavily contaminated areas. And, and I think that's why OSHA felt that they could give that assurance and, and permit so us to So with a light proceed. coating of dust, which might have two or four or five percent for all you know asbestos in it, it's safe to have people remove it with no asbestos and legal for that matter with no protective equipment. Go ahead. Please. Thank you. Is it? Hold on a second. These mics do not turn on until the person starts to speak. And then they pick up. And we want no comments from the audience, please. As part of the EPA cleanup of the residences, we were involved in doing 156 safety and health inspections of those uh, cleanup operations uh, to look at what was happening with the workers that were involved. Some of those involved uh, scope A, the, the, as I understood it, no visible dust, or scope B, where there was some visible dust, as well as any cleaning of the heating and air conditioning systems. And as Ms. Callahan indicated, during scope A, they were <coughs> not wearing the protective uh, uh, equipment, the respirators, but they were during scope B and with the, the HVAC. All of our sample results for those 156 uh, cleanups did not show any overexposures for asbestos. Okay. In fact, as far as air, the majority of them I, were non-detected. I, I, I have another question, and the, the, the yellow light is on. Oh, thank you. I have two more questions. One should be very quick. It's to Ms. Porter. You said that we should do a lot more screening. Uh, what about medical care for people who are res uh, who, who the screening tells us uh, need medical care? Do you think the federal government should get into this in a big way on this? Um, I think that, um, as you've heard Mount Sinai testify, 40 percent of the workers are uninsured that have gone through their screening program. And um, in those instances, there is a need for some bridge funding to enable Bridge funding? To, some funding to some, enable some people. Some sort of funding. Thank you. Ms. Clark, um, if I read your test, in fact, your testimony was uh, that there was low levels of contaminants uh, or safe levels. I, uh, you read that testimony here. I have here. Um, OSHA's breathing zone samples revealed the exposures well below the agency's permissible exposure levels for the majority of chemicals and substances analyzed. By the way, that's interesting. Does that mean that there were dangerous levels of a minority of substances uh, um, tested? There were 3 percent of all of the samples that we analyzed for all of those substances that I mentioned were found to be at or above the permissible exposure level. Okay. For those anything. were, for however, within the protection factor of for, the respirator for, for any we substance. recommended. For any substance. Yes. There okay. Were, I can. I, I don't want more details now, please, because I do have to finish the, the real point of the question. And you, you go on about you tested a lot of things and they were 95 percent were below detection limits for asbestos, et cetera. And you gave out all these um, 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 respirators. My question, and you also testified, you also said that the key to success at the World Trade Center site was working in partnership. Given this, it was a success, yes, in the fact that no one was killed. But how do you regard it as a success? And more to the point, given all these low levels of contamination, why are the majority of workers who worked at the site have lung impairments of one sort or another at this point? Why do we have what I regard as a catastrophe of hundreds, maybe thousands of people uh, who have uh, not just people caught in the cloud, but of workers, of people who came and worked on the pile? The majority of workers tested, I've seen estimates in some departments up to 78 percent, have long-lasting uh, lung incapacity problems of one sort or another. And we have no idea, obviously, yet how many are going to come down with cancer 20 years from now. Given the fact that there were these low levels of contaminants and a wonderful job was done giving out respirators, why do the majority of workers have very severe health problems at this point? Mr. Nadler, I am not a physician, so I can't speak to the health outcomes. I can tell you 
what we did, what we found. I can talk about the fact that I had people there every day looking for safety and health issues. I had people there around the clock asking employees, begging them, sometimes almost coming to blows with them to wear respiratory protection. We did hear from the employees that they were uncomfortable, that they sometimes interfered with communication. Clearly, they did not wear them all the time. And that's very unfortunate, and I regret that very much. I really feel, though, that on our part, we and the other safety and health professionals did everything we could to get the proper respiratory protection on the site and to have it available in such a way that the employees understood why they should wear it. We provided the risk communication. Unfortunately, the risk communication sometimes suggested to some of them that because we weren't finding high levels in certain areas, that perhaps they didn't wear it. I think if you'll find, look at, however, certain groups, the ones that were doing more of the drilling operations, the ones that were doing the welding and cutting, where we did have some higher levels, up to 5% of the samples, sometimes over uh, the permissible exposure levels, you did find better compliance. You also found better compliance from the trained construction workers who were more accustomed to wearing respiratory protection. It was a very, very horrendous situation, working 12 hours a day, fires. It was, it was not a let situation me, me, where it was just, very easy. I a, cannot answer, though, why of course not. the health outcomes. Let, let me make a comment, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> I've looked at this for two years now. We've been doing a lot of work with a lot of people. It is, it's, it's clear to me that I fault nobody uh, for lack of, uh, of wearing respirators or getting the respirators, et cetera, for the first few days, maybe a week because you had to get in, there might be people alive, you gotta get in, you do the job, and you know, and, and maybe precautions uh, um, um, take second place. But after the first few days or the week or the first two weeks, there were people working on that pile for months, and you've heard that our previous uh, panel, uh, whole departments apparently, and it may not be your department's fault, maybe some other departments or the city of New York or somebody, weren't getting the proper protection. And the second thing I want to say is that, and I don't want to, I'm not going to go into detail now, this has been at other hearings, but these statistics on these, um, 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 on, 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 uh, on, the, on the, this testing of pollutants, they do not jive with a lot of the other testing. For example, the testing uh, that um, the uh, U University of California said Davis on the contract with, I think it was the Department of Energy, when they put the, uh, 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 instruments on the roof of 201 Varick Street, where my office happens to be located, the federal office building, a mile north of Ground Zero. They were placed there from on uh, October 2nd. They stayed there, I think, till mid-January. They found levels of volatile organic compounds, dioxins, mercury, everything known to man. Uh, they said the worst uh, chemical factory they'd ever seen, worse than the Kuwaiti oil fires, for several months afterward. So this was a very, very bad pollution thing, it shouldn't be minimized, and the people who were there were subjected to very bad conditions, and we're seeing the results now is from the first panel, um, and unfortunately, when, I don't want to characterize a particular department because I don't know, but um, the efforts that were made obviously weren't satisfactory, and I say that now not because I want to condemn anybody, but we have to learn, uh, for God forbid, the next time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. And let me just say, I thank the, um, the questions from uh, all our panelists. Uh, uh, I know how heartfelt this is, and I know how important this is. I also want to say um, to our, our, th our three primary witnesses and also uh, to, um, to Ms. Callahan, who also responded, that um, uh, I've been very impressed with your testimony. I've been very impressed with your sincerity. Uh, and I, I said to both my colleagues on both sides, Ms. Clark, you did a terrific job. You did. And uh, you're under lots of pressure. You have been, but you've done a terrific job. And uh, we, we, we do know that we've got our challenges. Um, I am concerned that the administration seems so reluctant to release some data from EPA and to answer questions, which it, 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 it makes me feel that they have a story they don't want to tell. And yet, when I hear the story, I, I think it's a, a fairly good story, if not a very good story. 
I thought, Dr. Gilman, your presentation was very helpful. I, I, I would have liked to have seen it sooner, and I know it's a work in process. I, I, I totally agree with Mr. Turner. There is not a person who didn't know that whoever went to Ground Zero uh, was dealing with a building in absolute flames with gases, with every conceivable thing burning, plastics to asbestos to whatever. And, and I even know that there was talk about whether people should go down there like members of Congress to visit. But you know, we wanted to, to at least thank people for what they were doing. Um, and it's probably likely the first week was the most terrific and uh, everything else went down in terms of its ultimate impact. It is, it is surprising to me there were so re many respirators, not surprising to me that people didn't use them. Uh, having built part of my own home, knowing when I should use it and knowing I didn't want to uh, and forcing myself to and it just, it, they are not easy to work with, especially when you want to get a lot accomplished. So, um, but we need questions answered and I think, I think Dr. Gilman, you know that. Um, Ms. Porter, I have a particular concern with how money has been allocated. I mean, the first panel described one or two instances where we're not getting they're not feeling they're getting the money in due time. And if anything could happen from this hearing, I'd like to think we could see some quicker response there. I'd like to, uh, Ms. Maloney to just, just outline some issues and maybe you could respond to them. In uh, December of 01, uh, 12 million was released for the monitoring and uh, FEMA released another uh, 20 million um, for the registry and four million out of the 90 that we appropriated quite a while ago, practically a year ago, uh, was released for emergency uh, continuation. But uh, my question is, we heard from the fire department earlier, and as we heard from uh, Mount Sinai, the 25 million for, that the fire department was allocated and earmarked for them hasn't been released. And uh, the 65 million for the monitoring hasn't been released. Now we're told you're reviewing how you're going to release the money, but it seems like we have a, a system in place that seems to be working, uh, and it seems that we should make sure that it continues. Uh, we have people on yeah. waiting lists trying to get in for, for monitoring, and uh, there's some concern that, that there'll be a gap in the services and uh, basically, since the money's been sitting there for well over six months, why hasn't it gotten out of Washington and into the hands of the people that are providing the services for the sick uh, first responders? Um, we've been working very aggressively with um, Mount Sinai and the other clinics in New York that are providing services um, to these workers, as well as with the fire department. <laughs> And um, as you've all mentioned, this is a new and unique um, experience that we're going through. There has not been a long-term medical monitoring program set up like this in the country ever before. And we are wanting to ensure that it is as comprehensive, that it reaches as many workers as possible. And with um, our partners have been working aggressively to put it forward. I can guarantee you that there will be no lapse in funding um, between the baseline screening and the long-term medical monitoring. Um, the funding will be out no later than March of 2004. March um, 2004. And um, mm -hmm. the um, solicitation for that funding will come out in, on November 10th, um, giving people enough time to write their application and put forward their proposal. Also, uh, they testified on the first panel that the money is not there for long-term screening. Uh, they testified that experts, um, medical experts, are saying that this should be tracked at a minimum for 20 years because right. many of the health problems may not emerge. Uh, we are hearing they're, they're emerging a year after, two years after, five years. Uh, one doctor testified he anticipated cancer 15 years out. And I'm told from the first panel that the funding that is in place is not enough for the 20-year monitoring and have you looked at how much it will cost for the 20-year monitoring? How far does the 90 million go? Also, it seems that you want to branch it out to other places, which seems to 
counteract the, the whole idea of coordination and having it in one place? Right. Um, what we want to do is through um, this um, committee that we will establish um, is to have clinics working from the same protocol, working together um, so that the data is compara comparable. But we want to make sure that workers have access and that workers have choice um, as to where they want their medical care and screen, excuse me, medical screening program delivered. Um, so that's um, why we're. But uh, have you done any studies as to how far the funding oh, will go yeah. for the for, for the I knew expected I, I knew I wrote. twenty mini, twenty year right. uh, review yeah. period? Yes, ma'am. Um, we believe that um, in fact the money that has been appropriated thus far will serve us for the next five to six years, mm -hmm. and beyond that. Um, we will be working in concert with um, our partners to define what needs are subsequent to that. We agree um, and that the 20-year follow-up program is what is necessary. So, Could you get back to us with how much more you think is needed? Right. Also, you, you testified that there were environmental health studies being done. And uh, what are these projects that were listed in your testimony and, and what are the status of them? And as I said, uh, uh, some of the um, Victims are saying they were treated in Brooklyn, that the, the, the uh, plume uh, affected the health in Brooklyn, that the uh, number of people that went to the hospitals were up as much as 23 percent. Have you done any studies on what happened in the intake in other hospitals as a reaction to 9-11? Um, yes, there have been some studies that have been funded um, with, with the NIH. Um, and we will be happy to provide you the data on um, when those studies are expected to be completed and the, and the results of them. Thank you. Ms. Porter, I'm going to suggest that maybe we could get the members here to meet with you and to just go over some of those uh, dollar issues just so we're clearer about that as Great. well. I think uh, Major Owens had a few more questions and we're going to kind of close this panel up in a second. So. Just one or two questions uh, related to the workers who were involved in, in the cleanup of the apartment houses and the offices uh, adjacent to the World Trade Center. Uh, you said you made 156 inspections, did I hear correctly, of those particular sites? Those were the, ins uh, that was the cleanup that EPA did of the residential uh, facilities in Lower Manhattan from May on. Uh, we also conducted, uh, uh, evaluations of prior, and these were enforcement inspections, uh, for areas outside of the 16-acre <coughs> project. That was during the time from basically October on. Uh, we started a, a, an emphasis program, especially uh, to look at the buildings that were most heavily affected around the site, where there was the greatest level of cleanup. Now, it was so documented that contractors had brought in a large number of immigrant workers, undocumented workers. Uh, there was even a mobile unit set up to encourage those workers to be tested. Are you familiar with all that and what was OSHA's role in protecting those, those workers? I am familiar with the mobile van, testing van, and actually we provided some information at the van. We uh, took over our poster in both English and Spanish, realizing that there were some immigrant, uh, possibly non-English speaking uh, uh, people coming through there. Uh, and we also provided the sampling results summaries that I had talked about that we provided to workers on site. We also provided those to that mobile van as well. And um, we were, um, uh, again, as I, as I indicated, doing inspections outside of the project. We, it took us a little while to come back because, as I indicated, we lost our, our whole office. And, but, and we were having so many people involved at the site. But, but we did start, uh, we resumed enforcement inspections You know who overall. those contractors were? You have listings of them? Uh, no, I have, we have did never received any I, do you mean the ones that we inspected? Yes. The but ones who were employing the immigrant workers? Uh, I don't have any specific names. None were ever give, provided to us in that regard, no. Yeah, th these names and well, so on. How would we track that down? I suppose we could ask uh, the, uh, the group that had the mobile van if they had any names of contractors. We did not receive any complaints out of our posting of our, our uh, 
information there, and we, we did attempt to try to, to uh, determine if we could get any referrals for inspections, but we did not receive any. But we could certainly ask that of, of the individuals who ran that van. Uh, just to continue, if, if we're interrupting you, if you gentlemen yield, uh, Ms. Maloney has some point that she... We, we know that there were five general contractors who were assigned to the site, so we could merely ask those contractors whether or not they were involved in this. Uh, those answer. five contractors I'm quite familiar with, they were the partners in, mm -hmm. in the project. The I think mm -hmm. Congressman Owens is talking about work up. that actually was occurring outside of the project outside that of, were not mm -hmm. uh, contractors working for, for those uh, uh, general contractors. Then the city of New York would have a listing of it, the, uh, the organization that oversaw well, we'll that. We'll track it down, though. It needs to be tracked down. I, I think that's but the point. I can assume that there were no, OSHA did not go into a non-enforcement mode for those people and agree that there that, will be that's correct. no we, we, enforcement. The only area that was a consultative mode was within the the 16 air, air, acre World Trade Center site itself, the recovery mm -hmm. project specifically. And it was only because that site was still controlled by the FDNY as the site commander and eventually the, the uh, city uh, department of design and construction. They were the incident commanders. And so within that area, we did consultation. Outside, we resumed enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Is there anything that any of our witnesses and uh, Dr. Wagner and Dr. Williamson, if you also, sometimes I, I notice that people who say nothing ultimately in the end have the most important things to say, not to put pressure on you. <laughs> But if any of you would like to say anything, please feel free. So um, is there any comment that you'd like to make? Mr. Yes, Gilman, if I uh, could, Dr. Gilman. Uh, during your remarks, you suggested that there, were, there was data available or, or data that EPA had that they had not made available. I'm not aware of anybody asserting that we've withheld data associated with these monitoring activities. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't want the data, but information about specifics. Uh, there are questions asked, and there don't seem to be some answers to them, and we'd love those answers. Okay, and, and I know we're processing some, some information requests uh, for the congressman, and I, I know they're working on that right now. Yeah, so. and, and let me just say, members of Congress um, feel very protective of a member who, in his own district or her district, needs information and and so uh, you would find both re Republicans and Democrats alike wanting Mr. Nadler to get this information and it's information obviously that we're all interested in. I guess my only point was the more I hear the story the more I feel that it is a story that has some answers to uh, and it is just I'm struck also by the fact that data was available to a lot of different agencies and no government agency said to another, don't share this information. I do know this, though. I do know the administration, shortly after September 11th, in general, about a lot of things, was trying to calm people down. And I got in a little <coughs> bit of a dispute with some of them about how I thought they were understating the risk of terrorism, un overstating the safety of flying airplanes and so on. And you know, to try to calm people down, I, I think you tell the American people the truth, whatever it is, and they then want you to do the right thing, whatever that may be. And so your point is well taken about the data. Dr. Wagner, did you want to say anything? Well, only that I think a number of the questions that were unanswerable today point out the need for high quality, continuous collection of the best information that we can on the affected workers and others, as well as the importance of continuing analysis and research so that we can understand the nature of the health effects, the best treatments, and the ways to minimize the adverse outcomes. Ms. Porter is nodding her head, so you spoke for her in that instance. Dr. Williamson, any comment? Yes, I'd like to thank you, uh, Congressman Shays, for acknowledging the importance of the registry. I would also like to reinforce the fact that we do think that this is a unique opportunity for folks to uh, participate in a database that will allow us to track and determine what the health impacts have been of the World Trade Center, both long and short term. Uh, I'd also like to respond to um, 
one question about the uh, uh, lessons learned, and one of the things that I would uh, like to reinforce is obviously the collaborations are critical. But I think another thing that we're doing at uh, CDC and ATSDR is putting together a mechanism which will help us, God forbid, we're ever in a situation as we have been uh, in September, uh, to have a rapid response registry so that with um, perhaps a, um, a quick funding mechanism along with a rapid response registry, we can gather some of the important scientific data that Dr. Wagner mentioned and yet at the same time get it out in a timely fashion so that uh, uh, the funding and the infrastructure is there. Thank you. Let me um, thank um, obviously my colleagues for their uh, participation in this hearing and also both panel one and panel two. You have been an excellent panel. I want to thank our audience for its cooperation and also to say uh, it's clear to me that there uh, is more to the story that we have to deal with, more issues. It's clear that there are residents in the area who have concerns. There are workers in the area who have concerns that, that these concerns need to be addressed. We've learned a lot of lessons on September 11th. We know we have a lot more lessons to learn. Uh, I want to also thank the staff of Mount Sinai Medical Center for the use of this facility and all their help preparing for the hearing. I want to thank um, uh, Congresswoman Maloney and her staff. Uh, they've been terrific. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, David Rapallo of the minority staff for the full committee and Larry Halloran, my uh, chief of staff for my subcommittee. Uh, and let me also recognize uh, the work of Christine McElroy uh, and, and Bob Bridges of the subcommittee staff. Uh, Christine uh, did a tremendous job uh, preparing us for this hearing. And finally, thanks to the official reporter, Jennifer Rosario. Thank you very much. And to uh, all that made this a very uh, important hearing, thank you. With that, this hearing thank is you, adjourned. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now a look at some of the programming today on our companion network C-SPAN 3. A Senate committee looks at the future of NASA with testimony by Sean O'Keefe, who heads the space agency, and Harold Gaiman, who led the investigation into the Shuttle Columbia disaster. That's live at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. And in the